Hello guys, before I start I just want to make sure that you know what I'm talking about. This is a pretty pretty old what if, all the way back from 2020. So yeah, and it's also one of my most popular what ifs and it's also 25 episodes long and I thought why not make a full series out of it because I don't have the full series of it so might as well. That being said, enjoy. The current age is 732 and the Saiyan King's son, Vegeta IV, has been born. However, there's something odd to his appearance. He looked like the king, but not at the same time. He was covered in reddish fur, had longer dark hair, blue eyes, and red eye lines. Vegeta was absolutely speechless and demanded to run tests to see if that really is his child. Tests have proven to be true, he is his son. They then measured his power level with a scouting device, and since it cannot really measure high, they measured about 24,000 before it's self-destructing. At the same time, Broly was born and the same thing happened just with Broly. His jumped to 10,000 before destroying the device. They decide not to tell anything to King Cold. Cold's son Frieza took over the force and, well, they gave the Saiyans the scouters. With those new scouters, they measured Vegeta again. This time, his power level being 40,000 before breaking, since it was a basic ass scouter. They realized that the kid is a real monster, and the king decided to keep him. While 40,000 is a big number, Vegeta's true power level is around 1 or 2 million, because, well, I mean, he was born with Super Saiyan 4 as a transformation as a whole. They thought Vegeta was the Super Saiyan of legend, and he was, but on a much higher level. During the next few years, another baby was born and that is Kakarot of course, being born at age 737. He was considered a low class and was about to be sent to a planet to be conquered. However, Bardock and Gine denied the proposal and let Kakarot stay on Vegeta. All the while, during the years, Vegeta has improved his strength, growing to about 10 million at most. That power level is enough to push Frieza to his final form. Vegeta was assigned for a mission by Frieza and he left to do it. While Vegeta thought that was training for him, it was just a delusion for Frieza to destroy the planet with the myth of Super Saiyans. Frieza began preparations, but Vegeta already finished everything he needed to finish and returned to the planet. He was almost too late as Frieza just launched his ball towards the planet. Vegeta immediately destroyed the pod from the inside and went in front of the blast to disperse of it. Frieza was speechless that a mere monkey child can repel the attack of that magnitude. He was pissing his speedo, but Vegeta spared no one as he went in front of the Kumstain Lizard and punched him hard enough, he cracked and broke a few spine discs. Vegeta, now enraged as fuck, rushes to finish the job. Frieza tried going into the second form to counter, but Vegeta broke through the aura Frieza was pushing out and landed another punch, which actually managed to paralyze the cum stain. So, you wanted to get rid of us, huh? I am the Saiyan of legend, you fucking cum stain lizard. Frieza had nothing to say to the prince, so Vegeta made sure to dispose of him quickly and painfully, and he does. He disintegrates Frieza, not leaving a single cell behind. King was watching, and he knew what happened, and that cold's gonna come for all of them. So he assembled a few hundred Saiyans and asked of them to go to another planet outside of Frieza's and Cold's boundaries, and with young Prince Vegeta in lead, they depart in space. They located a planet called Mars, it's located in a solar system, and it's close to Earth of course. The king specified not to start conquering anything, rather to send one of the babies to the planet in order to see if the race that lives there is peaceful or hostile. Since the atmosphere on Mars was weak, they opted to teleform the planet, but for now they started gathering resources. About 200 Saiyans left Vegeta and settled on Mars. They decided to send Kakarot after negotiating with Bardock and Gine since they were on the planet, and so they departed him in the float pod towards Earth. A few minutes later, Goku is on Earth and is found by Gohan. Now since Kakarot wasn't sent as an infant to Earth, he was able to speak and so he introduced himself to Gohan and in reverse. They settled in Gohan's hut. 
On Mars, which is named Mars because Saiyans asked to conceal the race's identity, they start observing the planet and they think Earth's inhabitants are pure hearted. They almost shat themselves when Gohan saw Kakarot's tail, but he didn't mind it much, he just thought it was an appendix. From here, Kakarot experiences the same things as he did in original in that time span, including the head injury. Bardock knew the impact was hard enough to cause some kind of brain damage, but he didn't know it was long lasting as Kakarot got amnesia. Gohan immediately took him in to heal up. Bardock and Gine decided it was enough and they got to getting Kakarot back. Gine escaped while no one was looking and without Bardock fled to Earth. Upon arrival, she sees Gohan outside praying so Kakarot gets better as soon as possible. He then senses a presence behind him as he turns around and sees Gine. He asks who she is and she answers truthfully saying she's Kakarot's mother. Gohan then takes her in for a talk. She spills out everything about the Saiyans and where they are located right now. After the conversation, she decides to leave Kakarot with him. Back on Mars, Bardock finds out and so does Vegeta. Vegeta thinks nothing of it, even so he wants to meet the king of the humans. With that, they began preparations for the meeting of the two kings. Prince, well now with King Vegeta, has decided to meet the human race and to have a conversation with their king. Vegeta needed a messenger so he sent Bardock to do it since he was proven worthy of the Saiyan race, despite being a low class warrior. So Bardock heads to earth and lands safely in front of the king's castle. Bardock gets to the door and is met with the guards. He wanted to just push them away but he was warned to be polite and so he told the guards that they're on a planet next door and would like to meet him as the human race. He arranges a quick meeting with the king and he realizes it's a dog. He almost cracks up but asks if he really is the king. King Furry confirms it. Bardock then tells him how he belongs to the same race and how they settled on Mars, despite being reluctant. The Earth King is confused and asks Bardock to elaborate. Bardock then continues on about their race but conceals the secrets. The king would like to meet their leader and Bardock is happy he succeeded in his mission thanks to the dog and departs back to Mars. He tells Vegeta the good news and so they arrange the meeting. He asks of his bodyguards not to hurt anyone as that will set a bad image for the humans as they want to live peacefully. The day has come and a few ships descend before the Earth's king's castle and they introduce themselves. I am the king of now terraformed Mars, Vegeta. I see you have a nice planet on your own. We come in peace, I just wanted to notify you humans that we have colonized Mars so we can live in peace. During the speech, Bardock dipped out of there and started searching for his son. Midway he looked at the television in a nearby shop and saw Vegeta giving his speech. He cringes and moves on. He recognizes Gohan from what Gine told him and asked for Kakarot. He sees his son, however he's just playfully running around. Bardock comes over and picks him up. You listening to your old man? Yes. Good. Take good care of him. Bardock then calls up Gohan in the woods to talk and they then go. I am his father if you haven't noticed. I know he has amnesia and doesn't remember me at all. He doesn't know that I am his father. You're my dad? Uh, I- Yep. Kakarot overheard the conversation and finally understands why that man looks just like him. They explain everything to him, including where they live. Bardock promised he'll come back every once in a while to train little Kakarot. With that touching moment, he heads out. Back at the castle, Vegeta and Furry have become allies. Furry likes Vegeta and his race as whole for strong passion for combat, and Vegeta likes Furry for being so simple minded. With that, they have a nice dinner where the Saiyans eat Furry's yearly supplies of food in 10 minutes while Furry and his guards watch on in utter confusion. After the meal, they return to Mars and they tell everyone the good news. Without the influence of Frieza's, the Saiyans are free on their will. Vegeta even recommended to make every Saiyan equal like in the past, but he got a whole lot of middle fingers from elites. On Earth, it was time to head to bed. Kakarot looked in the moon without knowing what he can become and so, he went to Zaru. Bardock picked up a power level and immediately realized what's going on. He rushed to Earth. 
All he saw were remnants of what was left of Gohan's house. Kakarot was just rampaging all around. Bardock charged up an attack and swiftly aiming for the moon as to not remove a thing that makes Kakarot a Saiyan. He destroyed the moon and Kakarot is phasing back to normal. Bardock decided to stay on Earth with Kakarot and he also invited Gine. Mars has been about 50% terraformed and oceans are appearing, eventually reviving some ancient species that live there. Since the humans knew Saiyans aren't here to kill them, they're plundering around unharmed. The trio managed to find a place to live on Earth and they started adapting to the human life. Gine got a job at a retail store, literally doing what she did on Vegeta, and Bardock became a security for a bank. Since humans knew of them, they didn't have to hide their tails. While on Mars, they have made excellent progress and the Saiyans are getting much leaner with the death of Frieza and are getting accustomed to their new life. They are more into gathering resources for terraforming than fighting. Vegeta has trouble training in such low gravity and wants to cooperate with humans to find out if they can make a gravity machine or something similar. Vegeta touches down on Earth once again and asks for something of Earthlings. He asks Furry if there are any good engineers on this planet. Furry replies that there is. There is a big ass corporation called Capsule Corp and they may help him with his cause. Vegeta thanks the dog and moves on. He got to Capsule Corp and was invited in right away. Dr. Briefs comes out and asks how he can help. Vegeta explains Mars' gravity and how back on their home planet, they had 10 times then on this planet and asks of him if he can build something, uh, well, sort of an amplifier machine. And Dr. Briefs agrees and also tells him some of the stuff he might have to watch out for. Vegeta thanks the doctor and tells him he will get a big prize if he succeeds. On his way out, he meets Bulma, Doctor's kid. Bulma sees him, gets fluttered, and blushes. Vegeta doesn't really understand it, but he does know she took a liking towards him. The Saiyans are starting to kinda pick on him for falling in love with an Earthling, and each and every one gets smacked in the head. Vegeta gets his gravity machine and starts training with it along with a few of his guards, while other tech-savvy Saiyans are researching on how to spread the effect of gravity throughout the area so other Saiyans have a place to train in as well. A few months have passed by and the scientists are making progress with the machine. Mars has been terraformed about 65% and a mini ship similar to a Saiyan pod lands on the planet. Vegeta was the only one who wasn't afraid so he went to get it. Inside were some of the scouters and a note saying, Son, if you're reading this then you're lucky. We are currently under attack and I don't think we'll handle ourselves much longer. You can figure these scouters to communicate on a different frequency every time we contact someone, so he can call, can't hear us. Call me as soon as possible. He then starts mourning and regretting his actions. He then opened up a suitcase containing 20 scouters in total, then he grabbed one right away and contacted whoever answered. It was his father of all people who answered. Are you able to defeat King Cold? So you're telling me to call you and the first thing you ask is I can help you kill Cold. Well, do you want Saiyans to perish? No. Exactly. If you can, come here and defeat him. You... Do you know Cold is much stronger than Frieza? Yes. And you do know that my power level isn't big? Yes. So, I don't think I'm gonna defeat him as easily as I defeated Frieza. Or at all. I'm gonna have to train. Okay, but hurry up. I don't think we have much time. With that, Vegeta started training harder than ever, and since the gravity influence acts in a long way, the other Saiyans have gotten a taste of Vegeta's 500 times gravity training too, and are training within it. We skip forward a couple scouter communications and a month later, and Vegeta is nettled to the point where his power level is as big as Frieza's in his final form. He then goes towards planet Vegeta along with a couple of other Saiyans. When they arrive, they see the planet in ruins. A couple of Saiyan corpses and a few cold henchmen. Every Saiyan present was trying to fight back, and Vegeta's men just one-handedly beat them senseless. Cold heard about avenging Saiyans on Vegeta and he goes there with the rest of his force. What he doesn't know is that little Vegeta is there and is waiting to pound Cold. Cold arrives and Vegeta is there already in his stance. 
Cold gets out and he sees Vegeta first and starts roasting him how he's a kid and all. Vegeta, not giving any fucks, rushes Cold and lands a powerful kick to the chin. That attack was strong enough it threw Cold into the ship, destroying it whole. Cole now has nowhere to escape, and that was actually the plan. Vegeta had to make sure it's only him and Cold in that fight, and that no one is going to interfere. With Cold stuck on the planet, their battle began. Cold powered up and attacked Vegeta. Vegeta just casually dodged every attack with relative ease, and then released a couple of his punches, and Cold could dodge, but barely. Vegeta powered up slightly, not notifying Cold about it, and he landed a fat punch in his face. Cold was running out of ideas and energy as he recklessly attacked Vegeta. Vegeta was dodging his punches and kicks. Vegeta then got really bored and caught Cold's fist and ripped off his arm. Cold was screaming bloody murder, and for a good reason as Vegeta kicked Cold in the back of the head with all his might, breaking his spine, paralyzing him like he did with Frieza, then kicked him again in the ground. Cold was now helpless, and even his henchmen came in to assist to at least do a little bit of damage to Vegeta, but it was all in vain as Vegeta just pointed his fingers at them and shooting through them in true Vegeta fashion. With Cold left on the ground, he prepares to blast him away, but Cold did something no one thought of. He blasted through the planet and through its core. With that, the planet began exploding. With no time to waste, he seemingly disintegrated Cold as fast as he could, took his father and a couple of other Saiyans, fired up the engines, and in the last second, departed. However, the explosion corrupted software in Vegeta's pod, and with random coordinates, he let it depart to wherever. Planet Vegeta is gone, and all that's left are 250 Saiyans on Mars. Vegeta was scared of where he is going, but he knows it will reset the preset coordinates, and with that, he departs into the unknown. Vegeta lands on an unknown planet and doesn't know where he landed. He gets out and looks around. No one is around, so he goes and explores around. He sees someone in on the corner of his eye, and he comes over and sees a person behind the rock. Why are you hiding? Are you evil? What? No. I landed here. I guess you can say I'm kind of stranded. You work for Frieza? I can tell you have his armor. I killed Frieza and his father, so no need to worry about that cum stain anymore. Frieza got killed? Yes, by me. Intriguing. So you're not here to harm anyone? Nah, I just need to fix my ship and get back to my own planet. Vegeta is then introduced to a few other Yardradians, and they're pleasure to meet someone who isn't their own. They gave him food and he started vacuuming it all up. They recognized what he is and questioned him. You're a Saiyan, correct? Yes, I'm a son of King Vegeta. Everyone is stunned that they're talking to royalty. And a good Saiyan too. You're not violent like your comrades. <sighs> when you live next to a planet with peaceful life, you change, you know. Oh, so what planet is it? I'm currently settled on Mars. I've heard of it. It's about 7 light years away from here. Earth is very habitable and has life, but Mars isn't. How do you even live there? Oh, we are terraforming it to host life. We even have gravity multipliers in some areas. I've never heard of this before. After a short talk, they continue to feast. On Mars, King Vegeta has arrived in one piece and started waiting for his son. Back with Vegeta, He's trying to see what caused the problem and he managed to find a culprit, but doesn't have resources to do it. Yardraz offered to help Vegeta fix his ship and Vegeta complied. He started training there while the Yardradians are trying to fix his ship. They failed to fix the onboard software so they tell Vegeta will take time reverse engineering the software that's used to control the aircraft and that it won't be within this month as it is very corrupted. Vegeta was bummed and the Yardrad instant transmission to get some tools and programmers, then came back. Vegeta started cursing out the Yardrad, stating that with that technique, he can reach Mars no problem. The Yardrad explains the technique as well as some of the cons. Vegeta then apologizes and tells the Yardrad his plan if that's the case. He tells him he needs to learn the technique, while they try to fix his counter since it also got raped with the pod. He'll then contact one of his Saiyans to power up and hopefully 
he'll be able to return. Yardrat actually praises the Saiyan and gets to work. While that's going on, he starts asking around for Yardrat's experience with the technique to help him learn it, and the one who knew the planet Mars steps up. If you think he'll use this technique to conquer planets, you're sorely mistaken. No sir, I have a better plan on how to get back home. Vegeta then tells him the plan. So you're saying we'll talk to them before you do it, so you can trace their power level? Yes, that's exactly that. You're about to experience the longest few months of your life. Are you ready, Saiyan? You bet I am. With that, Vegeta starts his training to attain this unique skill. Back on Mars, King Vegeta says it's enough and that it will take over the planet and the entire solar system while he's at it so they can sell it for a good price. Every Saiyan disagrees, but he is the king so they have to pretend to obey him. They have the scouters on for every Saiyan on Earth to hear and Bardock is not happy about this. King Vegeta starts with Earth first and goes to pillage it. The second he lands, he's met with angry Bardock. Like hell I'm gonna let you do as you please. Go away. You obey your king. And you will do as I say. I'm way stronger than you. Don't make me laugh. With that, Bardock decked King Vegeta with one punch and kept him pinned on the ground with his foot. I believe you won't soon forget that a low class Saiyan had you under his feet, King. Everyone looked at Bardock whose balls were already hanging for 15 feet. I will be the second in command here, in the absence of Vegeta. They agreed and so Bardock took over the force, his headquarters being his apartment on earth but still he's trying to have a good life. The Saiyans finally have a good replacement for the young king and the planet seems to be good. It has been about 7 months since Vegeta landed on planet Yardrat and Vegeta finally managed to learn something called spirit control which is a crucial skill to learn to do instant transmission. He then starts his training on trying to teleport. His first order of business was to locate and teleport to the scientists repairing his counter. He locks on them and well he can't do it as easily as he had hoped. As much as he struggles he just simply can't do it. All he needs is focus and the Elder noticed it but doesn't tell it to him. After realizing the Elder knows he's doing something wrong, he focuses and teleports to them for the first time. The Ardradian was pleased to see Vegeta teleporting for the first time but still doubted whether he'll use it for good or bad as this technique is allowed to be used on this planet only. Vegeta celebrates his first attempt and continues on practicing the technique. It's been about 6 months since Vegeta landed on Yardrat and Bardock is in charge of the planet since the last part and is doing a much better job than both kings even since the power isn't getting to his head. However, something doesn't feel right as a ship similar to Frieza's makes a spectacular entrance on Mars and the Saiyans are pissing their drawers. Someone gets out but they can't quite put their finger on it. Out of all rods, it's cold and he is in his final form and with a whole lot of scars. Bardock naturally being the strongest there makes quick talk with the father Cumstain. What are you doing here? I thought I'd find Vegeta here. You know, the one who almost killed me. Cold is here for nothing but revenge. And also to destroy the entire solar system to pieces. The entire Saiyan is on their feet and is scared shitless. Vegeta is still mastering instant transmission and is close too. He's thinking about the Earth girl, Bulma. He's thinking about that sign of love and all, taking his focus off from training for a while. The elder Yardradia noticed it and knows what's up. You got a little bit of stardust in your eyes, huh? You wanna bang? What are you talking about? You're in love. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, I it's written all over your face. Who is that female companion you have a crush on? Yeah, well, there's one girl I met. She noticed me first and threw a sign. Well, all the more reason to hook up with her. She's not a Saiyan, idiot. How am I gonna continue my legacy with a half-breed? Worth a shot. Did you know that hybrids sometimes have a bigger potential? What? Vegeta is interested in the concept, however reluctant. After the conversation, Vegeta continues his training. The Ardradian scientists have finally fixed the scouter. 
They put it up online and they start transmitting to another scouter. King Vegeta answers and to say he exploded into the earpiece is too little, but I'm going to say it anyways, he exploded into the scouter, asking where in the hell he is, because Cold is after the entire race and the earthlings. The Audradian rushed to Vegeta using his instant transmission and gave him the scouter. Yeah, Cold is here and is more powerful than ever. Where the fuck are you for saying God's sake? Cold's back? Yes. Get your saying ass back now! I'm on my way. Hold tight. But first tell Bardock to power up as high as he can. Why him? Maybe because he's vastly more powerful than you? Ah, <sighs> alright. I'll do it. King Vegeta tells Bardock to power up to his maximum and in confusion does so. He powers up and King Vegeta realizes how much more he has to train to take the mantle again. Vegeta senses him and instant transmissions after saying his goodbyes and gratitude. Bardock sees Vegeta appear right before his very eyes, witnessing instant transmission for the first time and is confused as fuck. Vegeta senses cold and turns his attention to him. We meet again, old Kumstain. Indeed, Prince of 200 Saiyans. Well, would you like to get killed again? We'll see about that. With now powered up but holding back Cold, they initiate the battle. The battle starts off easy, with both Vegeta and Cold holding back. The battle prolongs for a little while before they power up with Vegeta using 20% while Cold uses barely anything. They reinitiate the fight and it's obvious that Vegeta is actually trying, while Cold is casually doing nothing but dodging, literally. He then becomes bored, powers up and starts pounding Vegeta. He enjoys it with all his soul. Vegeta is not liking it one bit, so he powers up to full power and tries to do damage to Cold, but Cold doesn't even feel it, so he gets knocked to the ground. I wonder what will happen if I went to the planet next door. Don't you dare try, Kamsane! Cold then uses his advantage of being able to survive in space and flies towards Earth. Vegeta follows him with his instant transmission and kicks Cold away but to no avail as they're hovering above Capsule Corp. I won't let you hurt the people of Earth. Not now, not ever. Your race is supposed to be ruthless. I'm surprised you didn't enslave those people. You could have proven yourself again, but no. We're not brainless idiots like you, Kumstain. After a short stare down, they begin to fight again and Vegeta is going all out while Cold is using a little bit of his energy. Vegeta is trying the best he can, but to no result as he finds himself back in the dirt. The rest of the force arrives and he looks on the fight. Even Bardock is there. Back to Vegeta, tries he might, but he can't even get an edge on Cold. Even so, Cold gave him a few free punches, but best they had is no effect. Not knowing what to do, he became enraged, boosting his power up a bit and mindlessly attacking Cold, but to no avail. Cold, being bored to his death at this point, decides to start killing off some humans, triggering Vegeta and other Saiyans even more. They power up from all their rage and attack Cold in unison, and this is where Cold starts to try a little harder, but holds his own very easily. Bulma looks out the window and wonders what the fuck is going on, and she sees the Saiyans attacking Cold, and also sees Cold destroying everything. She's scared out of her boots and steps away from the window. Vegeta keeps on trying and is getting blinded by rage, but it's not enough to put Cold down. Cold then bursts out his aura, knocking away the Saiyans. Cold then says, I see this is getting nowhere. I'm going to settle here for now. These humans might be of great use to me. If you can beat me within the remaining week, I'll leave this part of the galaxy alone. They know he's talking shit and what's even worse is that they have 4 days to train which won't make a dent on the tyrant. They are forced to leave with their tails between their legs. Corrin then confronts the Saiyans. I can tell you're having trouble with this guy. He's made his reputation to conquering planets from what I heard. Who are you, someone's pet? Haha, <laughs> very funny. You're making me to not help you. Wait, what? Corrin then proceeds to tell them about the lookout and how there's someone who can help them there. And so, after thanking a weird cat, they depart to the lookout. At the lookout, they meet Kami. I see your race and the human race are at stake here. Yes, Namekian. May I have your name? 
My name is Kami, and I'm a guardian of this planet. I would assist, but I can't do it unless moments at a time. So, um, this weird ass cat told us about a guy who can help us. Yup, that's me. I have something to show you. He then leads them to the entrance of the hyperbolic time chamber. This is a hyperbolic time chamber. What it does, it compresses time. Meaning a day out here is one year in there. Whoa, is that really possible? Yes, but here's a catch. You can only enter for two years, and only two of you can enter at once. Well, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. I think we can fit all seven of us in there. But the seventh needs a partner. There's this kid who has a whole lot of potential. We can add him. Broly, yeah. Heard of him. Alright, I'll go get him. Stay here. Vegeta then teleports to Mars and asks Paragus to take him as Cold is back and they need him since he has a lot of potential. Paragus is bitching about it, but Vegeta says that they'll get him back within 5 days. Paragus reluctantly lets him take Broly, and so they have the team. Vegeta knows of the kid's potential and takes him as his partner. Bardock takes Gine, the king takes Taro, being close to him and all, and Fasha takes Borgas. With that, the Saiyans decide to go in one at a time. King Vegeta, being smug, says he'll go first, and so him and Taro get in. They exit around one day after. They are plenty powerful, so much that the king can go head to head with Bardock, but Bardock ain't letting it happen. So him and Gine go in and exit a day later too, just like the king. Bardock almost surpassed Vegeta. Fasha and Borges then take their turn and get similar results too, being on par with Bardock. Broly and Vegeta finally take their turn. They exit a lot sooner and we see Vegeta and Broly all worn out, demanding some food. After vacuuming up all the food, Broly and Vegeta then depart towards cold. Once they arrive, a conversation ensues. So how you have you been, monkey? Why did you bring a kid here? Because this kid will wipe your ass at you once it turns you into a pancake. Oh, is that so? Broly then steps up, gets angry as fuck, and attacks Cold. Out of all people, Broly surpasses every Saiyan there due to his training. Cold is getting angrier, and so is Broly, landing a whole lot of hits on the tyrant. Cold is getting triggered and powers up to counter Broly. Broly is now getting beaten to a pulp, but that's what makes him mad even more, losing it for a split second and then he goes into his Inkari form. Cold is now having shit on his plate as Broly attacks him and lands a powerful punch in his head. Broly has to power up more now and after a whole lot of screaming, he attacks Broly. He's now on par with him and didn't expect to release that much energy after their training. He gets triggered and powers up to full power, knocking Broly to the ground, saying he doesn't want to play, he wants to fight. And he gets it as Broly powers up to Super Saiyan. Every fucking Saiyan is amazed by its power and wonder if it's the Super Saiyan of a legend. We have a flashback of how he attained Super Saiyan. Vegeta and Broly were sparring in a time chamber and Vegeta started tampering with him to get his latent potential out. This was a bad idea as Broly went nuts and went into the Inkari state. Vegeta could hold him off though, until Broly completely snapped and transformed into a Super Saiyan. The catalyst being how he misses his father and all and wanted to go home, channeling that into a Super Saiyan. Vegeta was impressed and overwhelmed by the Super Saiyan, so he decided to find out what it is and how to tap into it himself. So Broly and Vegeta are starting to scheme how the transformation works and call down the basics. Rage, need, and emotion. Something Vegeta has to work on to achieve it. Broly has succeeded to enter the form on his own, but Vegeta is having trouble, so he asks to give him a catalyst. Broly helped him with a full power blast, much like Goku did to Gohan in the Cell Saga. Vegeta has gone into his subconsciousness, picturing the solar system, Mars, Earth, and everything gone by Cold's hands, much like what happened to planet Vegeta. This has created a necessary need to transform into a Super Saiyan for the first time, exploding like crazy and after a bit of coping, he realized he's done it and then he finally realized what he was missing, or rather needed to access the form. With that out of the way, they're working on mastering the form and also making it more versatile in combat. 
Back in the present, Broly is now a Super Saiyan, and the Saiyans are wondering if it's the Super Saiyan of Legend. Broly, now being vastly more powerful than Cold, destroys his ass like you destroy your browser history. Cold is running out of energy, so he goes mad and attacks Broly with everything he's got, but Broly has given more fucks in his life and just takes the hit. Cold is surprised at the power up and also triggered that a mere monkey has done it. He's at full power at this point, while Broly is just starting to tap into his power. This is our power, bitch! The true power and the might of a legendary Super Saiyan. Cold is now triggered even more and goes for his death ball as a last resort. He gets so big that it nearly reaches halfway to Mars. He launches it directly towards Earth and Broly. It hits both Broly and Earth, but it does nothing. The blast is too weak to do anything and Broly just cancels the blast. Cold has used all his energy now and he started to get weaker every second. Broly just says, You're not worthy of my power anymore. Die in hell. Sorry, but I have some business with the bitch Broly. I'm gonna take him now. You go home if you wish. I'm not gonna let you defeat me. <sighs> you literally challenged us, Cumstain. You wanted to see our true potential. Now, I'm gonna kill you. Slowly and painfully. So you can finally realize what you've done to not only a planet I was destined to rule, but many more people that you killed and used to your own free will. You're nothing anymore. Nothing. I turn your son into ash, but I'm not repeating the same mistake with you. I'm going to kill you slowly, so you realize what you've done. Vegeta then paralyzes him just as he did back on planet Vegeta, and with nowhere to go, Vegeta starts slowly breaking him's limbs one by one while Cold is screaming in excruciating pain. Cold is pleasing with Vegeta to spare him and all that, but the young king of Mars is having none of it, and continues to break his bones slowly. How does it feel? Can you feel the pain you caused all those people during your tyranny? I'm glad you're gonna be gone once you die from a pain. Now, let's finish it, shall we? Vegeta transforms into a Super Saiyan and draws out his Keyblade. He started slowly puncturing through Cold to make him feel pain he deserved. Finally, once satisfied, he threw him high in the air and sliced him into a million pieces and blasted those pieces away just like Trunks did in the original. With Cold now gone, the Earth and the entire solar system is at peace. Boma gets out and blushing, invites Vegeta and the Saiyans to dinner. Vegeta remembers the old Yardradian's advice and accepts the proposal much to Boma's surprise. It's been a few weeks after the whole shebang and Vegeta has found his way with Boma, constantly visiting each other to Earth and vice versa. He gave Boma the scouter so they can communicate whenever they feel like and it really started to click between them with much more than with Yamcha back in the original Dragon Ball. However, this doesn't last as their Red Ribbon army enters the city and starts pillaging stuff there. Everyone cowers in fear as they run away from them. Kakarot hears the commotion and gets out wondering what the actual hell is going on outside. Kakarot gets out and just then a tank was about to run him over, but the tank takes all the damage, nearly exploding. Kakarot sees the carnage, breaks into the tank and questions him there. Then they cower in fear as they didn't know Saiyans lived there and so decide to dip out of there, but Kakarot killed them before they tried anything. Knowing shit is getting real around here and knowing both his parents are in a different city working, he has to take it into his own hands. The army is making its way towards Capsule Corp, but not before Kakarot comes and wastes them all. Literally. With that, they're seemingly disposed of and Kakarot goes to a nearby restaurant and vacuums most of their stock with his savings. After all that, Vegeta gets a call from Bulma and she needs help with something. She tells him about the wishing orbs called Dragon Balls and she needs help finding them. Vegeta stops for a second and thinks about what he can do with them. He ditches the idea of bringing planet Vegeta back because making Bulma happy is more of a priority for him. Vegeta agrees and he instant transmissions to her. They share a nice little kiss and Bulma continues with the idea and how they are attainable using a dragon radar she created. Vegeta is surprised and compliments Bulma's skills. They then depart to the unknown. They make their way to the first Dragon Ball, 
That Dragon Ball is, you guessed it, on Roshi's island. So they prepare to fly there, but before they can, they found Turtle on an island, looking for a shore. They share a look and then help the turtle get to the shore. Turtle thanks them and tells them to wait here, and at first they are reluctant but agree anyways. Turtle departs and they see he departed right towards the first Dragon Ball. After a while they see the Dragon Ball moving towards them. They see an old man on Turtle's back and that is of course Roshi, harboring a Dragon Ball. Vegeta sees it and instantly recognizes it. He asks the old man for it but Roshi is after the pussy. So he asks Bulma for underwear. Vegeta, once processed it, starts screaming at Roshi for even thinking something like that. Roshi notices Vegeta as a Saiyan and asks him a few questions about their race. Vegeta is now confused at this point and answers them somewhat truthfully. Vegeta then asks again for the Dragon Ball and Roshi is changing the subject yet again but Vegeta is having none of it, appearing in front of the old man and immediately proving his point to him and asserting his dominance. Vegeta then gets his Dragon Ball and the pair depart on their merry way. Meanwhile, Kakarot has returned home and thought of that army that started pillaging the city. He knew that there were more of them remaining since he knew that they're not the only ones and so he packs his shit, writes his parents a note and departs into the adventure. On his way, he gets up on a village and gets introduced to Oolong, a shapeshifter who is taking away women. He enters the village and everyone is inside, scared of him that he might be Oolong. Just as that happens, Oolong barges in as a dressed up demon, looking for a girl who he'll marry. Kakarot looks at him in utter confusion and then gets in his stance. Oolong attacks Kakarot but he blocks it with his finger. Oolong is now in danger as he transforms into a bat and tries to run away, but Kakarot flies up in the air and catches up to Oolong and catches him. The residents exit their houses and congratulate him on accidentally defeating the one who's been terrorizing them this entire time. They tie him up and question where are the rest of the girls and he complies, especially when Kakarot's around. They eventually rescue them and Kakarot enjoys a nice little feast there. Vegeta and Boma then enter the village and see Kakarot and the rest of the village there, wondering how can a kid eat so much. Vegeta approaches him and Kakarot notices him immediately referring to him as the king of the saiyans. The earthlings realize who that is and questions his appearance. He asks for a dragon ball and an old lady replies saying she has it and gives it to him. Kakarot is amazed by them being together actually and asks to come along if that's okay. Vegeta complies but Boma is in a bit suspicion. With that Kakarot, Vegeta and Boma go seek for their dragon balls. Vegeta compliments Kakarot's power, telling him that he has a lot of potential if he's so strong at his age and that he really can be of use in the future. Kakarot replies that Bardock trained him. Vegeta just brushes it off, knowing Bardock would definitely train him after finding out that gravity training exists. They are going for their next Dragon Ball. Vegeta, Boma, who is now on Vegeta's back, and Kakarot are just cruising through the air and come across Yamcha, who is trying to shoot them down. Vegeta fires a rocket at them, but Kakarot easily deflects it back to Yamcha, destroying his car and knocking him out. They touch down wondering what they'll do with him. In the end, Bulma straps Yamcha's legs to Kakarot's legs, and so they continue flying. Yamcha wakes up and shits himself. Vegeta just tells him that he's lucky he didn't die in the desert. Coming up to the fire mountain where the new Dragon Ball is located, they see massive flames and they can't physically come up there due to heat. So they descend down. Just then, Ox King comes before them and attacks them, thinking they're poachers. Vegeta catches the axe with two fingers and snaps the blade in half. Ox King started pissing himself and asked for forgiveness. So Vegeta took the opportunity by asking for the Dragon Ball. The Ox King tells him that it's up on the fire mountain, but can't get to it and asks if he can get the Banshu fan from Master Roshi to put it out. They remember the old creep and Vegeta says he'll put it out himself. He gets up in the air, transforms into a Super Saiyan and pushes large amounts of ki outwards, exerting even more with his hands. The fire is now starting to disappear, however the mountain is collapsing the more he pushes his ki towards it. So he does a finishing touch using a pond nearby. He fires a galley gun at it, splashing water high and far right into the mountain, extinguishing it completely. The Ox King tanks him and runs up to the castle, but they follow in case he's trying to ditch. He finds the Dragon Ball and gives it to them. 
They then go on their merry way after that. Before leaving, Ox King told them about his daughter Chi Chi and how she's stuck somewhere. They promised to find her and they then leave. They felt like they were hungry and so they stopped at a nearby village. Since there's no bunny Bulma, no one was scared. Yet. They went into a small inn to grab a bite to eat. Everyone is just amazed by their big ass appetites. Just then, a rabbit and two of who look like his men enter the village. Now everyone is scared and running. The squad gets out to greet them. Knowing they are up to no good, they question them, but they are met with a typical small villain answer. Yamcha goes to show them who is the real deal, trying to impress the Saiyans to make them think he's actually worthy, but as soon as he's touched, he gets turned into a carrot, followed by an explanation behind how the fuck he got turned into one. Now knowing Kakarot steps up and fires Monster Carrot a few weak key blasts in his face, tampering him even more. Just as Monster Carrot attacked, Vegeta gave him a good invisible punch to the gut, saying they don't need fists to beat him and to return Yamcha back to how he was before. Monster Carrot complies and returns Yamcha to his normal state, but then turns Vegeta into a carrot. Thinking he's won, he commands his henchmen to dispose of the nuisances. But then, the carrot gets out of the rabbit's grasp, laughing and asking if he'd like to be beaten by a carrot. Vegeta, being a carrot now, starts spinning and continually slapping Monster Carrot, before giving him a sharp punch in his gut, knocking him out. With the magic temporarily gone, he reverts back to his normal self and joking around, saying he's no pushover. Bulma is amazed that he beat the rabbit, being a carrot Monster Carrot tournament. With that, they depart yet again, having enough food for one day. We now see Emperor Pilaf and his gang down on their luck with their Dragon Balls. They encounter our protagonists and try to steal their Dragon Balls. Vegeta has a plan this time for people like these. He winks to the crew, letting them know what's about to happen and gives Pilaf the Dragon Balls. Pilaf being happy goes to summon the internal dragon. They summon the dragon but no wish is made as our gang comes behind them and knocks them out cold rendering their world domination wish useless. They then step up towards Shenron and they bicker with between who's gonna wish for what and how smart the decision is. Knowing almost all Saiyans can endure more than 20 times gravity, they decide to increase the gravity of planet Mars. The wish is made and now Saiyans can finally have a normal planet, well what they consider normal at least. Kakarot would love to do it again and they decide to go again in a year when Dragon Balls return to normal. Bulma then asks to come on Mars to hang out with Vegeta some more. However, Vegeta is a bit scared thinking she won't even endure it and tells her exactly that. Bulma ensures him she'll be perfectly fine and so they go. Her words quickly become void as she is basically pressed in a planet struggling to even move her hands. So Vegeta has no choice but to instant transmission her back to Earth. He then decides to train her to withstand such high gravity. Bulma whips out the prototype gravity room and they start from there. They start with two times and she needs to start doubling it first and of course she's having a hard time doing so. Knowing what gravity training feels like, she's finding training quite a bit interesting. She gets used to two times gravity in just a week and gets pretty strong. Vegeta then suggests doubling that and she does. This one takes a lot more than two times but she gets used to it in no time, having gotten used to it in about a month. But instead of doubling it, she starts to actually train and falls in love with training very very soon. Vegeta is surprised that Bulma is training and never expected her of all people to train. With peaking interest, Vegeta starts coaching Bulma on how to train properly how to make use of her diet to her advantage, and some tips regarding straining herself, as he still doesn't know humans don't get Zenkai boosts. She trains aggressively for an entire year and gets pretty strong for her caliber, going head to head with her soon to be husband. One day, Kakarot, who has grown up a bit, visits Capsule Corp with his parents and asks for Bulma and Vegeta. The entire family senses them training and they make their way in. 
They see Bulma going on par with Vegeta and Kakara is nothing less of amazed that Bulma of all people is fighting Vegeta and in such gravitational magnitude. Vegeta notices Kakarot and the rest of his family, stops training and greets them. Kakarot asks about Bulma first as he's never seen her fight and Vegeta just responds how she's gotten the will to train all of a sudden, that even he doesn't know what's gone into her. Having that out of the way, Kakarot then asks to go search for the Dragon Balls again. Just then, Bulma exits the room. She tells Kakarot how she already collected them, much to Kakarot's disappointment, but then backs it up saying she's doing experiments with them. She says she's trying to improve the Dragon Balls. Bardock and Gine, despite having Kakarot that knows of them, are quite intrigued into the term, so they join in on the mission. Bulma invites them all in and makes a quick talk with them before showing them the machine she's using to improve the wish orbs. As interesting as it is, Bardock is somewhat annoyed they don't get to go anywhere, but is interested in the machine and the Dragon Balls themselves. He asks what those Dragon Balls do and she says they can grant any wish she tells the Dragon Shenron and he grants it, hence the increased base gravity on Mars. Taking that into account, he asks for a wish for something and Bulma complies. She summons Sharon and the intensity of the summoning is way greater than the normal dragon can do. Sharon asks to speak up the wish and Bardock tells Gine that it's for the best. He then wishes to bring Raditz to their location. Sharon complies and they're actually amazed that Raditz is alive, but when he gets there, he looks like a fucking me in real life. He looks so skinny he's beyond recognition, also unconscious. They wake him up so he can at least comprehend what's going on. Vegeta then goes to look for medicine and encounters the Ajirobe. He knows in what kind of need he is and gives him a sense of being, also telling him to visit Quarren's tower if he has any time. He returns back and gives Raditz a sense of being. Raditz wakes up actually looking normal compared to before. He's still skinny but his skin is actually has a normal color. He asks where he is, but before he can finish his sentence, he sees his entire family right before his feet, minus Gohan. He rushes in to hug them all, but gets struck in the head by Bardock, who asks why did he let himself go. Raditz explains he was left on a planet with a very weird life form, and he literally had nothing to eat or anything. He had random patches of water around his cave, and he had to eat a weird sand. It helped some, but it didn't let him train whatsoever, so he had to rely on some shit tasting water and sand. They took pity on him for him considering how bad he looked, so they gave him some water and food, despite having Senzu a few minutes ago. While they're all eating, Raditz asked about a new life, and they say they have a new planet and king, pointing to Vegeta. Raditz is confused because Vegeta is so young, yet a king. Now knowing who is the new king, he asks if this is the planet they're ruling of. Bardock then points to the sky revealing a perfectly visible Mars, looking more like Earth than Mars. Raditz is amazed but keeps his composure. Bardock then asks him to choose, to either stay with them, or to go to Mars and be a guard there, and or do some shitty job no Saiyan wants to do. Raditz is weirded out and asks why. Bardock replies with how on Mars he is a Saiyan and on Earth he has a life. Raditz thinks about it and he replies how he needs to buff himself back up and how he will go train on Mars for a bit to get some gains and then he will return back to Earth cause he wouldn't want to be weak now. Bardock appreciates Raditz's thinking and lets him go. Vegeta instant transmissions him to Mars and then returns. So now the family got bigger again and they are happy and confused. Bardock and Gine are happy their firstborn is actually alive and Kakarot is confused he has an older brother. Bulma breaks the emotional moment and explains how the Dragon Balls will become usable after 3 months instead of 1 year. The squad gets happy to get 4 wishes in the span they could have gotten in 4 years, instead in only 1 year. Knowing that, Bulma activates the curing process that allows the shortening of time. They then return to their daily lives. 3 months later, a new threat has risen. Bulma goes to her laboratory and finds the Dragon Balls missing. She starts panicking as to who might have done this and goes into security feed. She sees a goblin looking creature sneaking, taking the Dragon Balls before disappearing into thin air. She grabs her spear radar and goes after the Dragon Balls. 
she flies as fast as she can and encounters Tambourine. Tambourine senses her and attacks her, but he's easily beheaded by Bulma. She takes the Dragon Balls, but before that she notices another goblin creature and Roshi, who she vividly remembers. Roshi is there to kill him, but he has no luck as he's easily picked apart and thrown into a mountain, despite Roshi showing off his tricks. King Piccolo then turns his head towards Bulma and starts complimenting her. Roshi looks on with his pervy eyes, but that quickly sinks as he witnesses Piccolo being decapitated and blasted away in just two moves by Bulma. Before dying, Piccolo spits out an egg and then leaves the atmosphere along with Bulma's blast. With that, King Piccolo is no more and the peace is yet again. After that, the Dragon Balls became slightly corrupted since they were removed from the machine and the dragon couldn't be summoned. So she returns them in a machine and lets them cure for another 3 months. Vegeta then drops in, being worried since he sensed something going on, but Bulma just brushes it off saying she's already dealt with the nuisance. Vegeta has brought something which he gives to this woman. That thing being Saiyan armor, now being actual Saiyan armor, telling her that this armor will protect her pretty good, while in reality she just wants her to look like a Saiyan. Bulma wears it right away and Vegeta compliments her looks, making her blush and wondering if the armor is turning on the Saiyans, so she keeps it on. They then go train. During the next couple of years, quite a bit has changed. Bulma and Vegeta are now married. Bulma becoming a queen, somewhat fulfilling her childhood dream of marrying a prince. Kakara is now in high school and is a very noisy kid there, also pretty weird. Now, Chi Chi has just started education there and isn't liking it one bit. Kakara notices she's a fighter like him and has dibs on her because Saiyan's nature is just so awesome. However, there's a girl who likes Kakarot, Mint. She's in love with Kakarot for a weird thing, his stubbornness and a will to fight as well. So it's kind of a love triangle in a way. Krillin is also there in the high school and is the bullet one. Kakarot soon finds his way to him and starts defending him, getting in trouble along the way. Mint asks Kakarot for a date and he is dumbfounded by the confession but agrees. After school they go for a nice refreshing drink and talk. He finds out her brother is a fighter too and is instantly interested in that side of the story. He starts taking a liking in her too, having an inner monologue discussing where to go for her or Chi Chi and decides to play along with Mint to see how that will unfold. All of a sudden, he senses a strong power descending into the city. Kakarot looks on as a green looking creature descends upon the city, destroying buildings for a neat entrance. Kakarot prepares for the worst, but all the creature asks is for a girl named Bulma Briefs. Kakarot is reluctant to tell as he just saw him destroy stuff around him and calling him out for it. The green creature decides to kidnap Mint, but is quickly kicked away by none other than Kakarot now promising their business is on. They both power up and it's obvious the creature has a higher advantage and starts pounding Kakarot into oblivion. Bardock senses the distress and rushes to see what's going on. He sees the creature preparing to kill his son, but he ain't letting it happen as he rushes in in his super saiyan, kicking him away. He then turns to his son, mocking him for not using his super saiyan and Kakarot replies with a typical saiyan answer, saying he just wanted to see how strong he is. Kakarot then gets up telling his father to leave and turns to the goblin. Kakron turns into his Super Saiyan and reinitiates the battle. The battle is quickly decided making the goblin lose. All of a sudden, Boma arrives on the seed and sees the goblin and shouts out that it's Piccolo Jr. and that he's come for her, recapping what's gone on 3 years ago. Bulma tells Kakarot to handle it as she's hopeless here as she's just a mere human and doesn't want to risk her chances. Kakarot complies and rushes Piccolo Jr., making him go straight in the ground. Mint is surprised in Kakarot's abilities and praises his power. Kakarot blushes and continues on. He walks up to Piccolo and tells him it would be a waste to kill such a strong opponent and that's the first time he made him feel so alive as a Saiyan, saying he made him whole again. Piccolo made his peace with Kakarot but he has one more enemy, Bulma. He knows if he tries anything right now, he'll probably die, so he makes his peace with his inner demons and leaves. 
Kakarot, still in his Super Saiyan, takes Mint by the hand, making her blush, walks up to Bulma, asks if she is alright. Bulma responds with yes and returns to her business. Mint is in love with the blonde Kakarot and asks of him to stay in that form, and he does. It's been about 5 years now and Kakarot and Mint are planning their marriage. Vegeta and Bulma are about to have a baby and Raditz returns from Mars to his family, seeing his family growing. He's at Bulma's place most of the time, talking to Bulma and helping her with things and that's when he hooks up with Tights. Raditz is now with Tights and they are a happy couple, both having a lot of similarities. Having said that, the ceremony for Kakarot's and Mint's wedding happens and he makes Vegeta his groomsman, being pretty close to him since his childhood. The newlyweds move to the outskirts of the city to have some peace, while Tights and Raditz have a place on their own near Kakarot. Bulma gives birth to Trunks and they're so happy they created a Saiyan hybrid, especially Vegeta since he wants to see if hybrids really are more powerful. Kakarot and Mint are also thinking about a kid of their own, while Raditz and Tights are discussing their relationship and come to terms they're pretty stable considering Raditz is doing training most of his free time. It has been quite a while and Trunks is a 3 year old kid. Everything has been going well and Kakarot impregnated Mint, so yay for Kakarot having a kid. It's been very peaceful. All of a sudden, a weird ship barges through the entire capsule corp, destroying most of it. Once it becomes stationary, out comes a boy with longish purple hair. He exits and sees Trunks. In a hurry, he transforms into a Super Saiyan 4 and apologizes to Boma for what he's done to the building, addressing her as his mother, before dashing out. Boma is confused, so she follows. Vegeta senses it too and it instant transmissions to the kid's location. The Super Saiyan 4 kid is there, confronting the remnants of the Red Ribbon Army. Vegeta and Bulma are really confused but decide to help. Kakarot and Raditz also come to the scene, followed by Bardock, Kine, and a couple of other Saiyans who happen to be on the planet at the time. The kid says not to interfere as this is his fight and dashes towards the soldiers, starting to blast them away one by one. It's all going well until he hits one of them and they're unscathed. Seeing that, he powers up and damages the soldier. The kid steps back and yells out to all the supposed androids to step up to be terminated. Most of them step up and some back out, especially the two kids. The kid then goes out and punches through them, making them malfunction and eventually die. Vegeta steps up and advises the kid to not interfere as he's supposed to protect the planet, but the kid says to shut the hell up and finish the weaker ones. Vegeta is really confused at this point and starts blasting the remaining soldiers away. The kid then gets his turn with the kid androids. One of them remaining androids commands the android 18 to kill the Super Saiyan 4, but the kid dashes towards the android and kicks his head off, decapitating him. Before crushing his head, he says her name isn't android 18, but Lazuli, and if he thought he could control them without them rebelling, then he was sadly mistaken. She then crushes his head in anger. Then, seeing what that kid has done to a relatively powerful android, even the Saiyan King was a bit scared of her as a 5 year old destroyed a powerful android. Knowing what they're up against, they prepare to fight, but they then see Lazuli completely mortified of her power, along with her brother who witnessed the entire thing as well. She realizes she's a threat to everyone in one sense, so she starts lamenting her life as an android. The Super Saiyan 4 kid is completely weirded out and confused, but lets them go without dropping his guard. Bulma slowly comes over to them to confront the kids, trying not to get killed if they go berserk. Her brother is joking around, being kids and all, and Lazulu responds with how in the hell could they even stand against them, addressing him as Lapis. Bulma now knows both of their names and addresses them accordingly. She then starts asking questions about what happened to them while Vegeta and the kid are taking care of business. Raditz, Kakarot and the rest of the Saiyans who came there just landed next to Bulma and assessed the situation. Vegeta took care of the last soldier, him being General Blue, and goes to the kid. The kid reverts back to his base state and asks Vegeta to have a private talk. Vegeta complies and they hide behind a rock formation. The kid explains that these were the androids and that his name is Trunks. Vegeta is just shocked to see his future son, 
but can see the resemblance and the Super Saiyan 4 transformation and wonders how he got into it from his normal state. Trunks says that there's more ways to become what he is than being born with a perfectly synced DNA to match the form. Vegeta asks Trunks to elaborate and Trunks indeed elaborates, saying that he was born with something called blood waves. Knowing what it is, he gets that part, but being born with it is a bit trickier, so Trunks continues, saying that the mutation in his DNA made the blood wave reactors in his tail very very sensitive, so he got blood waves from everything. Having that, Vegeta naturally evolved into what they called the Ultimate Saiyan, while in reality he was conceived with this and evolved by receiving random blood waves. Vegeta finally understood what his power actually was and that it was a normal transformation he was stuck in. Trunks then explained what happened in his timeline, hence being from the future. He explained that these androids caused havoc on Earth and killed almost all the Z fighters, leaving him and one more person that he is very reluctant to say the name of. Vegeta respects it but tries to get a hint out of his future son. Trunks just advises him to take a closer look at Raditz and Tights. Vegeta does so, but doesn't understand anything. Trunks then says his goodbyes and returns to his machine. He fixes the core components and the parts, leaving Capsule Corp open for everyone to see due to Trunks' appearance. Vegeta thinks about what Trunks said and comes to only one possible conclusion. Those two are gonna parent the person Trunks spoke of. It's been a few minutes after Vegeta figured it all out and he really is happy for the either one of them they will have kids in the future. Trunks of all people then returns back saying he's forgot one more thing. Since his timeline was fucked, he needed to train so he asked his father to train him. Vegeta complied and asked him if he can turn into a Super Saiyan in a Super Saiyan 4 state. Trunks is weirded out and says no since he never tried it. Vegeta tells him to do so and Trunks tries it out, but only manages to power up. Vegeta sees this is getting them nowhere, so he lets his son sense what he's doing so he can replicate it. Vegeta turns into a Super Saiyan and Trunks figures out he drew the power from his tail along with the feeling of transforming into a regular Super Saiyan, so he tries it again. Being unsuccessful yet again, he asks his father what he's doing wrong, despite Vegeta's utter confusion. Trunks begs him to train him or something to make his base power stronger. Vegeta complies and they then go train. He tells Bulma he'll go on his planet to train and Bulma doesn't really mind, even asking if she can really come to train the little Trunks along with them. Vegeta says yes and instant transmissions them all to Mars. On the planet, they train hard and they really are hitting it off with gravity, reaching tens of thousands of Gs of gravity. Vegeta sees Trunks slacking off and pondering and asks him what's wrong. Trunks replies that he could have had a nice family and all that has gone to waste. Vegeta, in an attempt to make Trunks mad to give him the best that he's got, starts insulting Trunks, telling him that he's a waste of sperm cells, that he's a weak shit, a useless waste of what he can consider good atoms, and with that, Trunks starts crying at first. Vegeta uses it to his advantage, calling his son a crybaby and a useless shit and all that. All that triggers Trunks, so he powers up recklessly. Vegeta is surprised to say the least. He sees Trunks' power grow a whole lot, so much it keeps multiplying on itself. He then glows as his body disappears in blinding light, and Vegeta can barely keep his eyes open. That was a perfect catalyst as Trunks reveals a new form never seen before. His hair was long and white, as well as his fur. Vegeta looked on in utter confusion and asked what is that. Trunks doesn't reply, he simply doesn't give a single shit and attacks the one who insulted him. Vegeta is overwhelmed by a lot and transforms into his Super Saiyan, but that doesn't help at all as he's being handed his very own ass. Vegeta starts regretting it, but knows it can be controlled if they put in effort in training. He tries to get to his son and tells him that it's okay, he can stop and starts apologizing in a way that makes him look like a bitch in an attempt to calm Trunks down. Trunks reacts, but gets angry again and Vegeta finds himself in a mountain and the next second in the dirt. Bulma sees that Trunks went completely nuts and flies through him, stretching her arms and begging Trunks to stop. Trunks reacts in a pretty unusual way, he starts attacking his own mother 
and then gives up, returning to his base and fainting on the ground. Boma catches her tuckered out son and husband and gets them in a healing chamber to get their energy and body health back. Once they're recovered, they begin to train to tap into that power Trunks previously displayed a few hours ago. No matter how hard they try, they just can't. Regio then remembers something he hasn't thought of. His emotions were weird, there were more of them releasing spontaneously and tries to apply that to himself. The good thing is that he finally began to go somewhere. The bad thing is that it's just that, he just tapped into it slightly. Figuring that out, he noticed he needs more emotion getting fueled in. So he tries it again, and with good luck this time, he transforms for a second, then goes back in pain, grabbing his head and collapsing, but still conscious. Vegeta now knows how Trunks felt like when he transformed, with approval from his son, saying that this form is just too much for someone as he can mentally scar the user since he went through multiple stages of every emotion. Knowing that, he goes and transforms yet again. This time, he manages to hold it up for a single minute, before falling back from it and grabbing his head in pain. He then tells the trick to Trunks. He tells him how he needs to feel what he felt back there, amplify it to the point of breaking and use his anger to transform. After a couple of tries, Trunks succeeds and maintains it longer than his father. He thanks his father and departs to the future, hopefully defeating the androids. Vegeta, Bulma and Trunks return to Earth and they go with their normal lives. With that, Kakra and Mint are finally in their parenting business, meaning Mint is finally pregnant. After all that, Bulma and Vegeta return to their normal lives. Kakra and Mint, as we said, finally got a child, which out of all names, Kakra named Gohan as Grandpa Gohan passed two months after Mint's child was conceived due to natural causes, as to carry on the heritage of the man who somewhat raised him and was of huge influence to him. Bardock was slightly disappointed he didn't pick a Saiyan name for the kid, but at least he had a Saiyan hybrid as a son, who proved to have a very, very big potential. During the next couple of years, nothing much changed. Trunks is now 18 and Gohan is 14. Radis and Tides got married at one point and got a kid of their own named Aurora, who was 7. Vegeta and Bulma had another one named Ashalot due to Vegeta's influence and Kakarot had Goten as from the request from Mint who liked the name starting with Go. Also revealing Kakarot was named Goku by Grandpa Gohan before Bardock took him away to train him to become a Saiyan again. Ashalot and Goten were pretty much best buddies and of the same age, training and messing around all day long. One day, they saw an advertisement for the Tenkaichi Budokai, and they were really wanted to participate. Vegeta and Kakarot laughed it off, but made it happen as the kids were really up for it, thinking they can both benefit from it. About a month later, they join in and see many familiar faces. Yamcha is there, along with Piccolo, Kami, and three other people who just couldn't take their eyes off of them. Also, two weirdos who were nice face to face, but very very weird considering they had a weird key signature. They sign up, thinking nothing of it, being made fun of all, all around the tournament grounds. Vegeta for his furry body, Kakra for his hairstyle, Trunks for looking like a girl, Ashala for being a girl, and the list goes on and on. Vegeta, being sick of it, sends them a nice little signal, pushing them all away into Kami knows what obstacles, making them forfeit and run away like pussies. Vegeta, now satisfied with his outcome, signs up the kids, however, there's a problem, they need to go in the kids division. Vegeta just says to let them in, sliding in a couple thousand zenny in. The kids take the punching machine and pass it with flying colors, and now for the tournament. Everyone is looking on and enjoying the fight, until one of the three baldies rushes out and attacks Ashalot from behind. Aurora is mortified, powers up and rushes to defeat the baldy but is stopped by one of the two weirdos from before, telling her to let it go as she'll be fine. The Bali then proceeds to suck a life out of Ashalot, who's frozen in place. Vegeta, who now mastered Super Saiyan 5, rushes to help. He's being frozen but his power is too much and the weird alien is overwhelmed by his power. The Bali finally lets go and departs as quick as he came. They then follow and the weirdo follows, explaining who he is, it turns out it's the Supreme Kai, and to say everyone was shocked is an understatement. 
He also explains what's about to go down. Apparently, a new evil arose named Majin Buu, and he's currently sealed in a ball. A wizard named Bobbity is going to use the power the guy named Krillin stole from Vegeta's daughter. His assistant, Kibito, is now healing Ashalot and tells the rest of the squad to follow him to catch who did this. Back with Shin, he explains that they need to follow from a distance because who knows what will happen to them if they're too close. The other two psychos are right behind them and ready to take them on. Those two are of course Yamu and Spopovich and they're there after their blood. Being weak, they get killed instantly by Vegeta's Ki Barrage. Their crew arrives first on the scene and hide their energy, knowing they can also sense energy, and they just look on. All of a sudden, out comes Bobbidi and Abura, thanking Krillin for all the power he got and tells him to go on standby. Our crew then expose themselves and rush in, but Abura spits at Gohan and Aurora, turning them into stone. Raditz went nuts and rushed in his ship and everyone reluctantly went in too. As they enter, Bobbidi tells them the test they have to take, while in reality it's just a decoy to revive Majin Buu. Vegeta's instant transmission is outside to see Pink Mist being released out of a ball, forming Majin Buu and Abura by his side. Vegeta swallows his fears but realizes just how weak Buu is compared to him. Kakar and the rest of the crew then come in and see Majin Buu, especially Kabito, who is scared shitless and cowering in fear all over the board. Knowing that Boma is Vegeta's chick, the boar spits on her, turning her into stone when she didn't even notice it. Vegeta is livid to say the least and goes Super Saiyan 5, one-shotting the boar in an instant for doing it to his wife. Once he does so, Boma and everyone got turned into stone and reverted back to normal. And now, Vegeta's focus is on Boo. And with that, the battle is on. With Vegeta and Boo in action, the fight is going very easy for Vegeta, but not for long. Every time Vegeta annihilates Boo, he regenerates back and the king is getting infuriated by the minute. Boo keeps on getting angrier and starts shooting candy beams at Vegeta in hopes of turning him into candy. Vegeta is dodging them with ease and pounding Boo into oblivion. Vegeta has never seen such a powerful skill, which is Boo's regeneration. Back in the ship, Raditz, Bulma and Shin are in there trying to find Bobbidi and his cronies, and they're not making good progress. Raditz has had enough at this point and blasts the floor of the ship, making a big ass hole all the way down to Bobbidi. It was a bit too late though as Raditz started holding his head in pain. No one knows what's happened to him, but Shin certainly does and runs to eat Raditz, telling him whatever he's done is in the past, he's not like he used to be, and how he changed and yada yada yeah. Raditz, no matter how hard he tries, he simply cannot control it and starts turning into something Shin fears the most. Shin then asks of Bulma, to go and kill Bobbidi and as soon as possible, so she does. She descends down the gaping hole and sees Bobbidi immediately. She has no remorse as she rushes towards him, however Pui Pui is in a way. What do you think, did she die to him? <laughs> nah, she made a hole in his chest as she was flying towards Bobbidi and he died immediately. The same fate met Bobbidi as he was literally disintegrated by Bulma. Having done that, she returns back up but not before red sparks surround the area around her and before she sees Shin falling on her unconscious. She knows something is wrong and goes up all the way. She sees Raditz, but he's a bit different. He's overly muscular, filled with popping vessels and an M on his forehead. Yakon then exits too, sees Raditz and is more than happy to become allies with him, now being something called Majin. However, Raditz doesn't give a single fuck and heads out on his own. Bulma now has to face Yakon, the last remaining Majin. She tries her best but simply can't grab an edge. She knows she has a trick up her sleeves but lets the fight go on as it did so far, trying to think of a trick to defeat the demon. However, it just gets worse as Yakon starts absorbing light, also making Vegeta wonder what the fuck is going on but not really minding it as Bulma is taking care of it. Sensing she has something up her ass she can pull out, 
and boy does she have something as she whips out a blood waves generator and shoots it at herself. The theory is that she took the blood samples from her husband for research and found out about S cells, the key components to unlocking a Saiyan form. She did tests and figure out how to inject them into human bodies to use them as a human and you'll see right now it worked. She started yelling and powering up as her muscles and energy started rising. Her eyes turned yellow and her aura became pure gold as she transformed into her Ikari state. Having accessed that state for the first time, her control isn't as she hoped for and also she didn't think that she'll enter that state and not the Super Saiyan, but let's it roll anyways. She now starts dominating Yakon. She's going hard. So hard, in fact, that Yakon starts relying on sucking in all the light he can suck in. It seems Boma is overtaken, but she loses it for a split second being in Karin state for a few minutes so far and completely obliterates Yakon with just one punch. Boma has done her business and now goes off to face Boo along with Vegeta and the rest of the squad. Raditz is flying towards Bardock in the meantime and once he found him, he drags him out in the open, berating him and challenging him to a fight. Bardock is confused but sensing something isn't right and they initiate the fight. So Raditz gets what he wants and Bardock finds out what's wrong with his firstborn. Bardock is starting to struggle the second Raditz attacks him, wondering what's gone into him. He quickly realizes that maybe he became one of those weirdos from a while back and Raditz confirms it without Bardock even asking him. Bardock knows he has to end it quickly and knows what to do. Since Raditz hasn't officially got Super Saiyan and Bardock has found a level beyond even, he taps into Super Saiyan and then powers up to stage 2. Raditz goes and does the same, much to Bardock's surprise. However, Raditz is weaker than his father despite being a Majin due to key strength. So Bardock uses it to his advantage. Bardock manages to defeat his son as Raditz goes unconscious. Back with Vegeta, he's still struggling with Buu and his regeneration. So what he does is he stops attacking to deal physical damage. Rather, he starts preparing a Gallic gun. Buu is infuriated enough already and is mindlessly attacking Vegeta. Vegeta just dodges while charging up the wave. Having charged it up, he waits for a good opportunity to catch Boo by surprise, but doesn't seem to find a good moment. Until he thinks about instant transmission. So he instant transmissions right under Boo and fires his combined instant gallon gun right at Boo. This time, his tricks work, and as he sees Boo get completely dominated by the full power blast. With that, as no Bobbity remained to control anything, Raditz and Krillin went back to their normal selves and the Earth was saved yet again. They healed the Kais and they said their goodbyes to them. It was a very peaceful time after Boo, so much so that Trunks has found his new mate, Videl. They hit it off and not only Trunks liked her feistiness for combat, but he also liked her looks more than anything. They got into college and lo and behold, they're in the same class, which meant more hanging out for them and also more suffering for the teachers as they kept berating the two. Fidel was trying to train hard for the next Tenkaichi Budokai as she's supposed to be present there, so when she asked Trunks, he was more than happy to help as his parents pretty much did the same. He taught her key control and quite a bit of physical training along with it. Even taught her the Gallic gun, somehow, making Vegeta proud when he dropped in on one of their training sessions. Also making him blush when he asked his son whether he'll marry the woman or not. With that, they're ready for the next tournament. Goten and Eshelot are so happy they get to participate again, and this time, being a bit older, they can legally enter the adult division. After 50 more days of waiting, they arrive at the tournament grounds. They see Krillin again, this time not Majin. They also see Piccolo being grumpy as always that Boma is there and Videl. Trunks immediately rushes to Videl so to back her up and be her support. Piccolo is utterly disappointed and can't wait to either kill her or hurt her enough to see what the son of Vegeta can truly do. He also compliments the Saiyans being more on Earth than on Mars even though he can teleport himself for more people instantaneously between planets. 
Krillin isn't really his old self and wants to prove to his masters and the Saiyans that he's the strongest one. The announcer berates the Saiyans for wearing armor, so they have to rely on their spandexes. With that, the tournament is about to begin, but Piccolo attacks Videl out of nowhere. She surprises him by blocking the kick. Trunks barges in and berates Piccolo, challenging him to a fight, and Piccolo agrees. With all that, the tournament finally starts and the first two on the lineup are Videl and Piccolo. The second the announcer announces the beginning of the match, they are everywhere on the arena, only our squad can see them go at it. Until Videl is met with the ground and we see Piccolo rushing towards her from the air. Videl fires a point blank galley gun right at Piccolo and he's also met with the ground. Now with both warriors on the ground, they had 10 seconds to pick themselves back up. Piccolo got up first while Videl was unconscious. Piccolo was considered the winner. To say Trunks was triggered was an understatement as he has a stare down hard enough even Piccolo gets the shivers. Next up is Trunks and Mr. Satan and to say he folded him is nothing. He dominated him hard enough Videl became wet. I'm just kidding, she knew that her father is way weaker compared to her, but lets his shit go as that's her main source of wealth. As Boma also joined in, she's fighting Goten, and at first Boma dominates of course, but Goten whips out his Super Saiyan. Boma, Vegeta and pretty much everyone who was there was amazed by the fact they achieved the status of a literal legend. Boma is now having a tougher time against the kid and she's getting pushed to her limits. She then starts raging and accidentally accesses the Ikari state, along with Goten completely speechless. They then end up in the tie, but not for long as Boma seems to have started to lose control of her artificial S cells and starts powering up higher and higher, dominating the fight again. Vegeta knows what's up but can't interfere un unless it gets really bad, so he observes. Boma's hair suddenly starts glowing and going up. Vegeta is about to get scared and a bit triggered. Boma then lost control all of a sudden and turned Super Saiyan for the very first time, screaming bloody murder and destroying the arena. Vegeta knows she'll burn those S cells pretty soon as she can't produce them on her own as it's a very low amount anyways. And that's exactly what happened. Boma faints, drops out her artificial Super Saiyan and just lays there. Vegeta rushes in to help and calls Goten the winner. After all that, Ashalot and Chi Chi of all people enters the ring. Chi Chi still has a teenager hissing fit because Kakara chose mint over her and wants to prove her youthfulness. However, she's out the ring in a matter of seconds by Ashalot. The quarterfinals are now over and semifinals are about to start. Piccolo, Trunks, Goten and Ashalot are about to fight next. Krillin and Chi Chi are watching from the sidelines and Krillin starts feeling compassion and starts simping on Chi Chi. The first to fight were Piccolo and Trunks. They begin and the first one to be dominated was of course Trunks, in his base even, as he wants to impress Videl with the one tappers and to Avenger too. He succeeds to win by a very hard kick to the neck. With that, Piccolo is out just as quick as he came. Goten and Ashlaw then enter and begin their fight. At first they are equal until Goten goes Super Saiyan. Ashlaw does the same. They keep on battling and wearing each other out. But Goten has a trick up his sleeves which is stage 2 Super Saiyan and he tries impressing Ashalot, just like Trunks did to Videl, but in a weird way. He goes for a sneak attack, which is a kiss in this case, and she buys the bait. Goten then sweeps her legs and throws her out of the ring, winning the tournament. Goten then kisses Ashalot for real, much to Vegeta's utter confusion and Kakarot's cheering. The finals between Trunks and Goten are there. They initiate the battle and it's clear Trunks has the upper hand, being trained by Vegeta. Goten has no choice but to whip out his Super Saiyan grade 2. Trunks responds with a normal Super Saiyan and keeps his composure. Trunks knows he has to win, but it's quite hard with grade 2 Goten on his way. But since he can't power up any further than that, he has to win by pure luck. After a long and enduring battle, they wear each other out and they get in a tie. Much to Kakarot's amazement and Vegeta's disappointment. Kakarot goes to Vegeta and compliments both boys, saying they have a long road to cover. It's been another couple of years. Trunks and Videl finally settle in, and with the help of Bulma and Hercule, they get a neat place too. 
Their marriage is coming soon and they just can't wait. But it might have to be postponed as the destroyer named Beerus awoken from his 38 year sleep. Beerus is asking for a super saiyan god of course, and Whis tells him how there is an infestation of saiyans on planet Mars and a small group on Earth. Beerus is triggered by the word of infestation and is written out how Frieza didn't fulfill his promise. Covered by Whis how there was a very unique saiyan child who killed him many years ago, going by the title of King Vegeta the Fourth. Beerus is getting interested in the concept of the Super Saiyan God, and so he asks Whis to take him to Mars first. Whis does so, but makes a few quick stops. First, he stops at the Kaioshin's planet after devouring a few planets on the way. He asks about the Super Saiyan God, and of course, the two Kais don't know shit about the so-called Super Saiyan God, so Beerus and his attendant depart on their merry way again. Next up is Kaiosama and after destroying a few more planets, they arrive on this little planet, asking for the, you guessed it, the Super Saiyan God. No one knows of the legend and tells about it in as much detail as possible. Beerus then says that there are a few Saiyans on Mars and Earth, and that he's gonna pay them a visit. King Kai instantly regrets saying that to the Destroyer, and he wants to protect them after all they have done to save and protect the universe. Beerus then devours a few more planets cause he didn't like the food and then heads to Mars. When he arrived, he saw a whole lot of Saiyans and that made him vomit of course. He knew that Saiyans here weren't as powerful compared to what he dreamt of, so he went to see if they can do something against him. He started key blasting shit all around him, alerting quite a handful of Saiyans actually. Back on Earth, Vegeta sensed the distress and went to see what's going on. He instant transmissions there and sees a weird cat. He has a memory in the back of his head, but can't quite put the pieces from where. Beerus then did his paralysis thing on Vegeta, and Vegeta remembered that exact time and location when and where it happened. The previous king Vegeta exits out this castle and immediately regrets going out and looking on what and or who created all the hassle and carnage. Beerus sees old Vegeta and goes to greet him and Vegeta is automatically backing the hell away from the destroyer. Vegeta says to stop the stuff and asks what the actual hell he's doing here. Beerus replies with what exactly he's looking for, which is the Super Saiyan God. He also says he can't find him anywhere. Vegeta then thinks about it, cause it's a damn new urgency, and remembers the Dragon Balls. Vegeta shouts to stop and pleads with him, saying he can get him the Super Saiyan God so he can fight him. Beerus complies and lets Vegeta do his thing. Vegeta tells him to come if he wants, he then goes to Earth with Beerus in tow. He then goes to Capsule Corp and asks Bulma for the Dragon Balls. He gets to the machine and summons Shenron. He then wishes for the Super Saiyan God to arrive at their location. But it's impossible, even though Shenron's power is increased due to the machine that makes it possible. But he does explain everything about the ritual and how it's actually possible. Vegeta takes every piece of information and listens on carefully. After Shenron disappears, Vegeta powers up to alert the rest of the Saiyans, and boy do they come. Vegeta then tells them the too long didn't read to them, and they agree to help. Vegeta is of course the strongest one, and they choose him. Having said that, five righteous Saiyans join hands and pour their energy into one Saiyan. At first nothing is happening, but then a light show appears as the Saiyans are embedded in white and yellow light. Seasons are changing left and right and whatnot, but at the very end, the red aura appears around Vegeta as he's finally became a Super Saiyan God himself, and is fully alert and ready to take on Beerus. With that, the fight is taken to the air and is initiated. The fight starts just like with Goku in the original, with Vegeta adapting to his newfound powers as he never used a such a powerful form before. Beerus is folding his ass of course, but Vegeta starts getting the hang of it and rapidly increases in his strength, catching Beerus off guard and landing quite a few punches on his body, giving him a bruise or two even. Everything is going according to plan until Beerus powers up, exerting more energy and attacking back. Vegeta is trying to keep his composure up and goes into defensive. Being slightly pummeled, he successfully takes the battle even higher up into space, where they continue the battle, this time about to go all out. Vegeta is getting angrier by the minute that a mere cat has humiliated both him and his father, so he wants him to suffer the same fate, using his full power and rushing Beerus. 
Beerus appears to have some trouble. After a nice little fight, that almost destroyed the universe of course, Vegeta returns to his normal state, but keeping the power. Beerus then realizes he has reached his peak, so he plans to end it all peacefully. Vegeta powers up the last attack and fires it. Beerus just takes it head on. He appears to have fainted and starts falling to the ground. Whis, who was stuffing his ass for the entire time, has noticed that Beerus is acting, so he plays along. Vegeta, completely worn out, just starts falling to the ground, having lost all his energy himself. Beerus and Whis pick up their asses and leave. With that, they might think the trouble is over, but Bulma gets mad at Vegeta for forgetting that it's her birthday. After the big incident with Beerus, Kaioshin visited to check in because he didn't really believe that the universe and Earth are intact since the power was so big, so he came to repair all the damage that those two caused. Vegeta on the other hand just forgot about his wife's birthday, so he went and bought a little necklace with a crown, which he thought is too little, but in the end, he got his dose of bedtime sparring with Bulma. After a couple of days, everyone was just chilling and training, recapping the events from a week ago, until we showed up asking for Bulma. Vegeta was mortified at first, but seeing how chill Whis really was at that very moment, he decided to just roll with it. He asked what he was doing, and Whis replied that ever since he tried Earth food, he's fallen in love with it, so that explained everything. So while Whis was eating, Vegeta was wondering what in relation were him and Beerus, so he nervously asked Whis of that. Whis just replied that he's Beerus' attendant. However, Vegeta didn't bite that, so he basically attacked Whis from behind, and of course, Whis caught Vegeta's fist with his chopsticks. Vegeta just smirked and said that he's definitely stronger than Beerus, and asked for further detail. Whis then explains that yes, he is above him in strength, and that he is in fact his teacher. Boma and Vegeta both sunk in and froze once they heard those words. Vegeta then muttered some words, but Whis then interrupted asking Vegeta that if he wants to train him, he demands a nice meal and he can only bring maximum of 4 partners including himself, and so he has to pick the 4. He knows humans doesn't have much potential, so he rules out Bulma even though it's very tempting. He goes and invites Trunks, who happily accepts, and Kakarot along with his son Gohan, knowing they wouldn't miss it for the world. With the team assembled, they're ready to go. Whis asks for one more thing, the previously mentioned food, so Vegeta has to think quick. Knowing that he hasn't got much time on hand and he's a terrible cook, he thinks about whipped cream and decides to do that. Whis is wondering what the hell Vegeta is doing, but Vegeta is going hard with the mixer in hand. He sets the table and Whis tries the whipped cream, and of course since he hadn't tried it yet, he enjoys it and lets the four go to train with him. They arrive on a planet and they see how different everything is but we start training them right away. Far across the universe, the little what's left of the defunct Frieza force are planning to revive Frieza. However, with tools and ideas on hand, they don't have much choice but to go on Earth. However, one of the soldiers reminded the captain that the Dragon Balls originate from the planet called Namek, and they can get their wish there, so they depart. Back on Beerus' world, they train hard. Trunks trains with Kakarot and Vegeta trains with Gohan. They're making excellent progress, even faster than in canon in fact. However, they got to get a hold of God Key faster and faster as the Frieza Force is on Namek and they're asking for their Dragon Balls, being super nice and understanding. Saying they'll revive Frieza as he'll understand his position and won't do damage ever again. The Namekians are still really suspicious, but they have a plan to get rid of them as soon as possible. They go and gather the Dragon Balls, and they're summoned in the Mechian language. They make the wish, and Frieza arrives. The second they revive him, they ask of the dragon to get them to the fuck off the planet. After that, they meet Wish for them to forget about the planet. With that little trick acted out, they return to their daily lives. With Frieza alive again, he starts swearing all kinds of profanities, wanting revenge on Vegeta, who killed him all the way back then. Frieza then goes and starts training really hard to try and surpass the king of all Saiyans. On Beerus' planet, the crew got their first taste of God Key and are now trying to master it. The first to get the taste of God Key by themselves is Gohan, 
then Trunks, then Kakra, and finally Vegeta. After that, they aim for the next level, and that is Super Saiyan Blue. They managed to do it after 4 months. Frieza, on the other hand, trained for 6 months instead of 4, just in case. After his vigorous training, he departs to the location his father told him in the other world, which is Mars of course. Meanwhile, the Quarte is pretty much just getting used to the Super Saiyan Blue and training with each other at this point. Frieza arrives on the planet Mars and begins his act of destruction. However, Bardock just so happened to be on the planet, training. Bardock is terrified that the entire Frieza force is there, including Frieza. Not to mention literally thousands of soldiers who came to rid the planet of Saiyans. After Bardock, Elder Vegeta came, as well as a couple of other Saiyans. Frieza looked around and doesn't seem to find a new Saiyan king, so he has a lot of time to enact his revenge. Or so he thinks. Bardock, pretty much being the strongest there, decides to go for a spin and try to beat Frieza. Frieza immediately goes to his final form, which kinda makes every Saiyan shiver. Bardock isn't letting his new home planet get destroyed just because of some revenge, so he starts pleading with Frieza, trying to make him find Vegeta on his own since it is his revenge and not their business. Frieza just attacks Bardock, even breaking a few ribs. Frieza says he has no time for pleading, as he waited for way too long in hell, just so he can let go a race he had to exterminate. Hearing that, Bardock just says, fine, and transforms into his highest form, which is the Great 2 Super Saiyan, and initiates a real battle. During the time, every Saiyan on Earth sensed that and wondered what the hell it might be, so they travel there. Upon arrival, Bulma, Ashla, and Goten are met with a, get the fuck out of here by Elder Vegeta and Bardock fighting Frieza. They realize that the guy is pretty much evil to the core and that they need to defeat him quickly as Bardock might not survive, so they start bickering about how they'll do that. They look around and see a few Super Saiyans wandering around, so they come up with an idea to summon a Super Saiyan God yet again. Elder Vegeta remembers the legend and starts bullshitting, saying that it's not possible, but Bulma knows what to do and gathers a few Saiyans. However, they need to pick the one who will be a Super Saiyan God. After all the bickering, they decide that Ashala is the best bet at victory. However, Goten steps in, thinking logically, saying she might not withstand the power and that he should be the one as he can go above Super Saiyan. So they then decide that Goten should be the one. With that, Boma instructs the Saiyans on what to do and they begin the ritual. The ritual starts and of course Frieza notices, so he tries to rush them, but Bardock gets in the way claiming that he is the one who is fighting now. The ritual is going well and after the ritual, Goten becomes a Super Saiyan God. Goten then flies up to his grandfather and takes over the fight. Bardock just falls out of his Super Saiyan and then on the ground due to exhaustion. With Super Saiyan God Goten and Frieza initiating the battle, it's clear Goten is dominating. However, not for long as Frieza starts transforming himself. He transforms into another form no one has seen before. And that's how Frieza calls it is golden form. Goten can barely comprehend it, but he starts putting out a fight. Meanwhile, on Beerus' world, Whis interrupts the squad's training, saying that there's an enemy on Mars and they won't believe who it is. Once Vegeta sees Frieza and Super Saiyan God Goten fighting, he instantly cowers a little and asks to be taken there. Whis says that it will take a while, but he will try as fast as he could. With that, they depart towards Mars. On Mars, Goten is trying to get a hold of a fight. However, he is struggling as his power isn't as powerful as he thought it would be. But he didn't know of the golden form of Frieza at all, so it really isn't his fault. Knowing he might lose, he is starting to think of a way to gather more energy. He's running out of ideas and energy, while the squad is running towards Mars to save Goten's damn life. The Saiyans, including Boma, are trying to think fast as to what they have to do to give Goten some help with the Tyrant. Just then, the Tyrant is starting to lose energy fast and he starts getting weaker, while Goten is getting more and more triggered. Although Frieza is losing energy, he can still keep up and probably will for quite some time. Frieza then uses the spare time he has between attacks to start tearing down Mars, and boy does he tear it away. He's just destroying everything he sees, and of course Goten is getting angrier by the minute. Frieza then says it's enough, and just one taps Goten with a few tricks of his own. Goten is now in some sort of a limbo, 
thinking to himself as to how powerful the tyrant is and starts blaming himself for the last tournament and how his brother always took the victory. That was the breaking point for Goten as he started screaming bloody murder as the area around him is surrounded with very bright and blue light. Goten has finally found a barrier that Super Saiyan God held and surpassed it using rage. He got up and went to face Frieza. In the distance, Bulma sees the same blue light from space. Taking a closer look, she sees the squad who left a year ago. We then see Beerus, Whis, and along with Kakarot, Gohan, Vegeta, and Trunks. Kakarot sees Goten and, in his Super Saiyan Blue, goes to him and taking over the fight. Goten is still full of rage and disobeying his father. However, he will realize that's not a good idea as his body can't handle it and he starts literally bloating up. He then listens and goes back to base with steam around him. With that, Goten faints and Kakarot looks at Frieza. Vegeta also joins in saying that it's his fault he didn't pay attention to what Frieza's men were doing, so he decided that it's his turn. However, Kakarot said that they all deserve a turn to test their new strength, and so Vegeta obliges. An intense stare down is going at it, both warriors wondering who is the other guy but they decide to fight it out since Kakarot has to protect his people. Once the battle initiated between Super Saiyan Blue Kakarot and Golden Frieza, it started with a big ass wave, knocking everyone either out or back a few hundred meters from the massive aura that was created. Knowing how intense the battle will be, they all grabbed their shit and got some distance. Goten woke up grabbing his head and wondering what the hell happened. The group explained it briefly and Goten was actually amazed that he achieved what they have on his own and looks forward to mastering it. Back to the fight, Frieza and Kakarot are going hard and are trying to surpass each other. However, due to Frieza having low control over the immense power of his form, he's getting weaker since the fight with Goten and Kakarot exploits it by powering down and still overpowering Frieza. Of course, Frieza gets angry and tries to output more of his energy, but can't, he still doesn't admit defeat. Kakarot is just toying with him at this point and is trying to make him matter. Frieza finally lost his form and dropped back to his final form. Frieza starts reminiscing his mistakes and how he could have ended the Saiyans ages ago if he went full power against Vegeta all those years ago. Kakarot then holds a speed similar to how Vegeta did before Frieza's supposed doom. However, Frieza decided to blow up the planet and he succeeds to do it. Whis then takes everyone out of the area in a little air pocket, while witnessing the entire planet getting destroyed. Vegeta is cursing himself, knowing he would end it quick, but Kakarot didn't listen. However, Whis mentions the temporal do-over magic trick he can do that reverses the time for 3 minutes at most. Vegeta immediately says yes to him, that he needs to do it to correct it himself. So he does so and they're taken back moments before the incident. Vegeta powers up to blue and rushes with a final flash. Kakarot notices and gets out of the way so the blast hits Frieza head on, completely obliterating him. Once the deed was done, Vegeta made a sigh of relief, dropped out of Super Saiyan Blue and descended back down. He was of course greeted with a triggered Kakarot went to get Vegeta for stealing his kill. But Vegeta then explained that it would be doomed if he didn't do it. After a while, everyone else explained what happened, and then he changed his opinion quickly and had to thank Vegeta for saving his damn life. With that, the whole universe in general has been saved from the impending doom of Frieza's. After a nice post-fight meal, they think through what to do next now that Frieza's gone. But before that, a massive hunk of metal crashed right in front of them. After the dust settles, we see it's a time machine, and guess who is inside it? Trunks of course. They set him lying on the table to rest up and to receive a sensu shortly. Once Vegeta brings the sensu and when he wakes up, he sees his own father and instinctively attacks him. Vegeta blocks it easily and asks what's wrong before Boma slaps him across the head, proving he's in the right timeline. He then rants about Vegeta Black and how he's there to tear the world as they know it apart. Just then, a rift opens, revealing a person that looks the same as Vegeta as we all know him. Black's eyes get directed towards future Trunks, wondering what he's doing here. 
seeing yet another trunks he figures that it's a timeline a bit earlier black then goes and challenges trunks to see what he can actually do but vegeta himself steps up and confronts his counterfeit he knows he doesn't have much time as the rift will start pulling him through shortly but still initiates a fight black powers up and vegeta sees just how powerful he is so he goes blue right away which as you'll see later was a big mistake they start the fight and it's clear that Vegeta has the advantage over Black, so he uses it. Future Trunks is a bit skeptical of his father's decisions, but still watches on as he never seen the form that he's using. Out of all people, Broly of all arrives, sensing what's going on. Bulma is surprised that he's still around and everyone greets him with open arms. Broly has trained, believe it or not. He asks where there are two Vegetas. Brad just implies that one of them is our Vegeta and the other is the evil counterfeit. Broly also asks about two versions of Trunks and gets sus. So Raditz explains that both are good, one is from the future and the other is from this timeline. Broly then continues to watch on the fight. Vegeta is dominating Black big time and boy does he take a beating of a lifetime. To his aid, the Rift reacts and starts pulling him back. He immediately rushes through it, attempting to destroy the time machine while he's at it, but fails to do so as Kakra reacts and kicks the blast away. Once Black was gone, they have all turned to Trunks with stern looks, wondering how he didn't beat such a weak opponent. Trunks explained further how Black can get stronger with every hit he takes, how he destroyed almost every living being on the planet, and he has a suspicion he might have a side man. Vegeta, Kakarot, Broly, Bulma, the younger Trunks, Bardock, and Elder Vegeta take it all in, look at each other, and just grin, knowing it's time to fight again. Since they had a working time machine, all he needed is fuel. Bulma opened the canister and looked inside to see something familiar. She then heads to her lab. Meanwhile, Whis and Beerus are there, telling the future kid that the time travel is against the rules of the gods and that it has a life-taking sentence if someone found out. However, he decides to let it slide for some high-quality food. Vegeta scavenges the last bits he knows Beerus didn't eat at the table, and with Beerus now fed and satisfied, they think about the strategy for when they get to the future. Just then, Boma comes with a full tank of fuel, ready to go. Trunks thanks his mom. Vegeta grabs a few sensus and a capsule from Bulma, and from there, Trunks, Vegeta, and Kakarot depart back to the future. Upon arrival, they see the carnage, and no shit went down in this timeline. And they now know exactly what Trunks went through, and Vegeta comforted him, seeing how bad it looked. They all arrived at the base, and Vegeta pulled out the capsule he was giving, revealing a big ass table full of food. With that, they exit the base and give a warm welcome to expose their location. Black automatically appears right above them and looks upon them. Kakarot, feeling a bit cocky, decides to go take on Black first to see if Trunks' theories are true. So he turns blue and rushes Black. At first he's doing good, until he gets stabbed right in the chest, dropping out of Super Saiyan Blue and falling on the ground. Black then went ahead and displayed something he has got transforming into Super Saiyan Rose, and it took a while for everyone present to actually comprehend what they're seeing. Now when they actually comprehended it, Vegeta goes blue and rushes black, trying to claim his point, but he gets put down too. Trunks has had enough and goes to distract black, telling the two to return back and get buffed up to finally be black once and for all. They do so with their pride hurt pretty badly. Upon return to the normal timeline, they immediately heal up, and without saying a word to anyone, except Broly who they drag along, they go into the time chamber. Kami says he removed the limitation from the chamber, so they can go in at any time they want. They thank him and they get in the chamber. In the chamber they train hard, all trying to surpass each other. Broly unlocked the legendary Super Saiyan for the first time and has mastered it. Vegeta and Kakarot have both got a taste of Super Saiyan Blue Evolution and they are mastering it too. Along with a lot of physical training, it took them a total of 2 years in there and once they exit, Beerus notices an insane change in power. They then get to the machine, not saying a word and go back to the future, where Trunks is still trying to hold on in the Super Saiyan 5. 
Seeing the trio come, he gets distracted a little and gets his ass kicked in an instant by Black and someone that's beside him. Vegeta recognizes him as a Supreme Kai and questions him. It turns out it's Zamasu and he has the same ideology for mortals and how all mortals should be destroyed. Vegeta, getting impatient, just appears in front of Black and gut punches him hard enough he spits out a whole lot of blood. Kakarot takes on Zamasu, seeing no other alternative and Broly follows of course. Zamasu is trying hard to get through them to help Black, but having two people on him, it's gonna be quite hard to pull off a stunt he made up. Vegeta is just literally handing Black his ass, just straight up dominating him. Black gets into a corner as he almost lost all of his strength to continue having all these injuries. Vegeta charged up his Gallic gun and obliterated Black, while the two on the other side were having trouble seeing the immortal Zamasu. Seeing an earring on the ground, Vegeta picks it up and tosses it to Broly, while he goes and instant transmissions to Zamasu and stealing his earring. Vegeta then commands Broly to put the earring on as he says something to try out. Broly does that and so does Vegeta. The earrings react and the two fuse. Zamasu is about to shit himself as Veroli comes out of the light, already in a blue state with hints of fur on his body, charging up a double final flash and throwing it at Zamasu. Zamasu is trying to regenerate, but fails as his body gets disintegrated. However, Veroli knows it's not over as he's right as Zamasu takes over the universe. Veroli has a second weapon, the Hakai. Zamasu's soul starts disappearing from existence and the sky gets much clearer and sunnier. Viroli then unfuses and the two start panting because they used such a powerful move on Zamasu. With that, they let Trunks clean up, but to take them back first. With that, the timeline has been saved yet again, but nothing lasts forever. After they got back to the future, they notified Beerus and Whis that a Supreme Kai was helping Black and how he needs to be surveyed to see if he does any damage. So with that intel, they ask for the name. Hearing the name Zamasu gets them suspicious very fast, seeing it's a Kai in training and everything. So Whis takes Beerus and Vegeta and they travel to the Universe 10 where they meet Goasu and Zamasu. Vegeta gets a first glimpse of a different universe environment and gods. He sees Zamasu and gets a little mad, but Beerus keeps him in check. Zamasu introduces himself and Vegeta is not happy about him still being alive and wants to end it fast. Goasu says how Zamasu is the strongest Kai in the entire multiverse. Vegeta, taken aback by the statement, asks Zamasu to fight him to test out that theory. Zamasu is reluctant, but with Goasu and his arguing with the Kai, Zamasu finally buys the bait. Whis knows this might not end quickly, but still allows it. Vegeta initiates a battle, and it's clear he's stronger than the Supreme Kai in training, even without the power-ups. Zamasu gets a clearer picture of the mortals, and swears he will rid of the multiverse from mortals. Whis stops the fight and asks for the time rings, knowing it might have created a new change in time. Gowasu goes to get the time rings, and Zamasu is just confused as to what the time rings are. Gosu opens the chest and sees a new time ring, indicating a new point in time. Gosu starts to suspect Reese, Beerus, and Vegeta, thinking they might know something about and ask them of it. While Reese and Beerus are hiding it, Vegeta spits it out in front of everyone. Listen Kai, we know of your plans to destroy mortals. I've seen with my own eyes. I had to defeat a counter for you from the future, as well as another me who literally had my body. Stop being a goody two shoes and tell your master how you feel. Zamasu is just speechless and doesn't know that mortals can tamper with time on their own, so he makes that his counter argument, but Vegeta backs himself up, saying that he started it, not himself, and that if he hates mortals so much, might as well become one to see how it feels like again. Vegeta then pulls out his hand to do a move Beerus recognizes is his own Hakai technique, swallowing a bit of fear as well. Zamasu then attacks Vegeta, but Vegeta has no remorse and Hakai is Zamasu. Since the future version of Zamasu was absolute and immortal, ending the current Zamasu was a piece of cake for him. Once Zamasu disappeared, Beerus steps in, bonks Vegeta's head, and berates him for destroying a god without proof. But Vegeta just simply mentions the new addition to the time ring chest, and they seem to have calmed down. With that, they leave the universe, and return home. 
A week or so has passed and Vegeta has some family time with Bulma, Trunks and Ashalot. Bulma announces Trunks will become a new president of Capsule Corp and they seem happy to have finally made some family progress. Ashalot is very happy for her older sibling and hopes that she can become a president in the future herself. That might have to be postponed as Daishinkan arrives in Capsule Corp, appearing right in front of Vegeta and his family. He says he was notified of the events from this and the future timelines and asks to speak to Vegeta as soon as possible. Vegeta cowers in fear and doesn't know how to reply, before muttering a sound that Shinkan disappears as he came. Vegeta knows he fucked up good and that he's done for. Just then, Whis, Beerus, Kakarot, Broly, and Goasu enter the house, worried and asking Vegeta if he's fine. Vegeta just replies that he is and asks why Daishinkan needs him. They say that he found out about the events that happened in the other timeline, and he's either gonna get destroyed or jailed for life, depending how he feels like. Vegeta swallows his fear and, thinking of the worst, goes and asks for transport to Daishinkan's place. Goasu takes them all to Zeno's palace and Aishinkan greets them with open arms. Vegeta is scared shitless for the first time in his life as his pride is tearing away, knowing something bad is gonna happen. Once they arrive to the place, Zeno, his attendants and Aishinkan are there. Vegeta is seated and they began discussion as to what should happen to him. Daishinkan says, You are introduced to the ultimate price of tampering with time by Beerus. He let it happen. Since you saved your universe and even other universes too, you will be let go. But from what I surveyed, your wife, or rather a future version of your wife, has created a machine that makes the time travel possible. Do so, you will not be destroyed, but your wife and all her research will as she's too much of a risk for the entire universe. What the? Are we clear? Uh, I'll do anything if you spare her life. Please, sire. You don't understand the situation. Us gods do not bargain. We have the final say. If so, then how about I decide my wife's fate by becoming a god myself? I see. You want to serve a universe, right? Becoming a destroyer is difficult, but due to your status, you'll have no problems. Please, give us one last chance. If I can't die, then I can at least serve my time to help this universe to save my loved ones. Alright, this might be against my better judgement, but I'll let you have it. With that, Vegeta was destined to become a new god of destruction, much to his happiness cause he saved the one he loved so much, and Beerus' sorrow because he was about to get demoted. Vegeta went under the ritual and was warned that all disorders that he was born with will disappear due to them possibly interfering with his power. Not knowing what that meant, he just told them to go for it, and they did. Vegeta went under a transformation, his hair certainly turned shorter, his fur disappeared, and his clothes switched with Beerus's. Vegeta comes back to Earth where Bulma was expecting him and at first gets into a fighting stance, but realizing that might be Vegeta, she drops her guard. Vegeta, completely emotional, breaks down and hugs Bulma, crying and telling her that everything is gonna be fine. Daishinkan then arrives the same way he did the first time and tells Vegeta that since he exchanged the title for his wife's life, he needs to keep a good eye on her. If she disobeys, he has to destroy her or he will be destroyed. Vegeta, still crying like a bitch, accepts these terms and tells Bulma to rid everything she has that is related to time travel. How it's a very high tier felony and that he barely managed to save her life by becoming a destroyer god. Now knowing and seeing what he's actually done, she swallows a bit of fear and lets Vegeta destroy every single trace of time travel equipment she has. Vegeta does so with the presence of Daishinkan and with Daishinkan happy, lets the two go. With Bulma now alive and well, Vegeta, Bulma, Ashlaw and Trunks all end up in a group hug, with Vegeta still crying, however for a good reason, he saved the one he loved. Kakarot also arrives and sees Vegeta in the embarrassing act, but Vegeta couldn't care less. Vegeta explains everything to Kakarot, also spilling the multiple universe stuff to him. Kakarot asks if there is anyone in the universe that is actually strong, and Vegeta says yes. Kakarot takes it quite Saiyanish like, saying that he'd love to fight someone, since he literally has nothing to do, so he asks to do a tournament between all the universes. Vegeta can't back down from a challenge, 
but doesn't know how he'll explain it to the Omni King and Dai Shinkan. So he thinks of a strategy for the right words to say to them. He knows that Shinkan will bend the rules since he's literally on his watch. So with a script to hold on to, he goes to Zeno's place and asks if he can arrange something for the upcoming future. Dai Shinkan actually thinks through it and says that they can arrange something for the incoming days. And if it ever happens, he will notify all the universes of it. In the meantime, Broly has visited Vegeta and Bulma at Capsule Corp, thinking how peaceful it has been. Vegeta and Bulma just look at each other and then tell the tale to Broly, who is dumbfound and asks how did it come to it, before realizing that it was the time trial that created the trouble. Now knowing how dangerous the upper divine beings can be, he takes extra precaution to follow their orders. Just then, Daishinkan arrives, saying that he has come to discuss the matter Vegeta asked before. Vegeta says to continue and Daishinkan elaborates, saying that they created an event, just like he hopefully envisioned, called the Tournament of Power. He then goes on to explain the rules. All the universes in the known cosmos will participate in the tournament, and there is a grand prize, the Super Dragon Balls, and they take interest in them. However, Daishinkan isn't done just yet. He goes on to explain how the eliminated universes will get erased from existence by Zeno, confusing everyone and forcing Broly to ask to elaborate, and Daishinkan does, saying that the losing universes will basically get destroyed. Yeah, that made everyone start sweating bullets, knowing they have to fight for something other than fun. Daishinkan says to gather the fighters within 50 hours in Earth time, and once they did, they will be transmitted to the arena. Kakarot, obviously confused and scared of Daishinkan's appearance, asks what's up, and Daishinkan basically recaps what he said just a moment ago. Kakarot sinks in, and Vegeta berates him for bringing up such a stupid idea, and Kakarot didn't mean it to end up like this, but since he brought them into this mount of shit, he has to do his work. But there's only one problem, Vegeta cannot participate because he is a destroyer, which Vegeta calls his total BS. But since he can't do anything and he has his own divine rules to follow, he follows them. With that, Daishinkan concludes the tournament announcement and leaves just like he came. They are now discussing who they should add. Kakra, Broly, Bulma, Ashelot, and Trunks are already there, so they are adding Gohan and Goten in, totaling in 7. Bulma gets an idea and goes to grab the Dragon Balls, without telling anyone what her wish is gonna be. They also add Bardock to the game, maxing it at 8. And they remember Fasha and Vegeta also remembers Piccolo out of the blue, thinking he might help them with their cause. Vegeta then tries to find Piccolo's key and realizes that he's on Mars, making it even easier to recruit both Fasha and Piccolo. He has transmissions to Piccolo, seeing him training under high gravity, and Piccolo senses him of course. Piccolo asks how did he find him, but Vegeta has questions of his own, asking Piccolo to join him. Piccolo rejects. But Vegeta still elaborates, saying that the universe might be at stake and starts berating him for not caring for his life. Piccolo gets triggered by that and asks for the price, since he aims for that the most for some goddamn reason. And Vegeta says that there is something called Super Dragon Balls and how if they win, they can grant literally anything in the entire cosmos. And Piccolo agrees for this reason only. So with that, he decides to take him to Earth and he obliges. He brings him to Capsule Corp and goes back to Mars to find Fasha. Now you might be wondering why her? Well, she's been on the planet for the entire time, getting stronger and stronger, to the point where she's ready for Super Saiyan 3 even. Vegeta visits her in another gravity chamber and says hi, then makes a proposition and also tells her not to tell anyone. Fasha agrees, saying that anything they throw at her, she's ready for it. Back on Earth, Bulma summons Shenron and she wishes for one thing, to become a Saiyan so she can actually become Super Saiyan without any artificial help. Shenron grants that wish and Bulma becomes a Saiyan, getting much younger but keeping her appearance. With that, the team of 10 fighters is assembled and now they wait and do some last minute training in a time chamber.
Whis then comes to the lookout where everyone is, along with now not so god destruction Beerus who is seen rocking the Saiyan armor because during the ritual, Vegeta's and Beerus' outfits got swapped. Whis thinks for a brief second and suggests how instead of using a weak Namekian, since Beerus isn't a god anymore, he can join in. Beerus, being scared of for his universe of course, after being told of the tournament, goes and takes Piccolo's place. But Piccolo isn't letting this spot go, saying that he needs his Super Dragon Balls and how nothing is gonna stop him in his tracks. Beerus knows the Hakai and slowly lifts his hand and threatens to destroy him. Beerus knows of his past and isn't letting him get in his way of fighting for his universe, seeing Beerus properly protecting it for the first time. Kakra, Ashelot, Goten, Broly, and Bardock exit the chamber and see that there is some beef going on. Piccolo was about to swing, but Kakra got in between, taking the punch without budging a bit, warning him that if he doesn't get his shit together, he will get destroyed. Getting scared for his life, he backs away. Whis thinks of an easy fix to replace Fasha, but she transforms into a Super Saiyan 2, surprising anyone and making Beerus go instead of Piccolo. Piccolo gets mad and attacks Beerus. No one reacts this time. Beerus just dashes under him and punches through his torso and leaving him on the ground. Kami knows what's about to happen and as he was about to spout out something, he collapsed. Vegeta dashed over in confusion and worry as he saw Kami pass away right before his eyes in the same time as Piccolo. Kakara said in complete lack of emotion that if he's an Amekian, that his death isn't as important because he's not an earthling. But Vegeta reminds him that he created the Dragon Balls, and without him, those balls are just regular old stone. Kakara then explains that there's a planet Namek, and all he needs to do is to instant transmission there and recruit another one. Vegeta does so and returns with Dende, a new guardian of Earth. With a few hours left to spare, they reanimate the Dragon Balls and amplify them the natural way by giving them three wishes. Once they did that, they were transported to the Null Realm. Upon arrival, they sent some rather stranger life forms and wonder what's going on with them. All of a sudden, they notice a very high power level coming from Universe 10. Seeing Jiren got them quite scared, but focused. Beerus suggested he takes on Jiren, being the most powerful. Kakara also wants to fight him to see how strong he is of course. Daishinkan announces the tournament and they begin. Vegeta is just disappointed he doesn't get to participate and he really like to, but rules are rules and he has to obey. The group, even though they are advised by Whis and Shin not to split up, they split up regardless. Vegeta is actually happy they didn't stick together as bitches and cheers them on while other universes talk shit to him. Vegeta just says how Saiyans don't fight for others, they fight for themselves, and if they have a problem, they can freely suck his dick. And that shut everyone up. Daishinkan envies Vegeta's race, how they have so much pride in themselves, but that's for their own good. Kakra takes on the love freaks from Universe 2. His father takes on the trio of danger, Goten and Ashala are in a group and are fighting Analaza a fusion of Paparoni and Koisareda from Universe 3 and the rest are on their own, fighting random participants with an exception of Gohan and Trunks being together, fucking around. Beerus gets the first couple of kills and Daishinkan says how there's no surprise, being one of the strongest destroyers, well, bin at the very least. Kakara also gets a few eliminations and so does everyone. The fighter count has dropped from 80 to 35 in the first 10 minutes since this tournament started. Vegeta is just looking on his fellow Saiyans and admiring their fire techniques. Even Beerus has a few of his own. Beerus, once done with the weak ones, goes on to take Jiren. However, Toppo and Dispo are in the way and fighting off the lone ex-destroyer. Beerus just increases his power and with the flick of the wrist, brings them both to the ground and out the fighting arena while he's at it. Beerus braids and makes fun of Jiren at first, thinking he doesn't stand a chance. The fight with Jiren against Beerus has begun, and to say the two went ballistic against each other is an understatement. The whole arena started shaking and turning into pieces. Minute 15, and Kakara is still fighting now transform Ribrianne. He transforms into a Super Saiyan Blue and tears her ugly ass apart, eliminating her from the tournament. He then moves on to Universe 10 Remnants, and although they give him a hard time, they too soon fall. 
Beerus is doing good against Jiren. However, Jiren goes and powers up and starts overpowering Beerus. Beerus knows if he doesn't go further, he's history. So he uses his full power. And that is his destroyer state. And starts going at it with Jiren. Seeing Beerus is using it, Daishinkan looks at Zeno, who replies how it's so shiny. So he lets it stay. Back with Beerus and Jiren, they're going at it. But Jiren is having some trouble. So he goes full power and decks Beerus to the ground with a few punches, making Beerus regret laughing in his face back there and passing out. Kakarot blows a gasket seeing that and powers up to his full power and attacks Jiren, but to no avail as he is knocked out in the same fashion as Beerus. Vegeta is just in the bleachers, dumbfound, thinking of a strategy to defeat the savage of an alien. Just then, Beerus gets up and begins to glow confusing Vegeta and exciting Whis to see it again. Beerus opens his eyes and unleashes his aura to see him transform into autonomous Ultra Instinct. He starts powering up, making Jiren sweat a little. Kakarot also explodes with a bright light, getting an omen himself. Jiren is now really scared and starts attacking Beerus, but Beerus is dodging it like nothing. He tries to save on Kakarot and Kakarot also seems to dodge every blow that was thrown at him. Vegeta is amazed that someone other than the gods actually surpassed him and takes pride in a low class Saiyan. Jiren is eliminated from the tournament and Universe 10 is through. With the rest also defeated, Universe 7 is victorious and the winner is chosen to be Goten of all people since he eliminated the greatest amount of them all, with Beerus being second. Goten is already making a wish for himself. That is to make him above Zeno due to his childish nature. Thinking through it, he realizes that they remain as the only universe. So he leaves the above Zeno thing for another time and decides to return all destroyed universes and people back. So he can actually rule over something. Daishinkan only said that the first wish would have been very bad. Because if he wished for that, his universe would be destroyed too. Making Goten's blood run cold and realizing that this was a real deal. Daishinkan then went and restored everything back to normal using the Super Dragon Balls. With everything back to as it used to be, they return home, waiting on the next foe to take them on. After the tournament, it has been very peaceful for a long time and everyone went back to their training. Beerus finally understood how to transform into Ultra Instinct and even better, master it. After a long, long time of being unable to do so, he got a chance to study it while he's in it and managed to make it his own. Kakra, on the other hand, is still wondering what it might be and asks Whis of it. Whis simply replies that it's a technique which separates the mind from the body, of a user of course. Kakra asks to be trained to use it at will and so does Vegeta. Beerus is still weirded out by Vegeta's new appearance and brings it up. And now that he has mentioned it, everyone else does. Vegeta explains how, during the ritual, he was told that any disorders he might have had will be nullified to make him as effective as possible, but he thought when he lost the Super Saiyan 4, he will lose power, but instead he maintained it. Think of it like a non-god Super Saiyan God base boost. Now that they settled it, they can move on with their life. After about a year or so, they get a visit by the Galactic Patrol. They say how a very evil wizard, more powerful than Bobbity, has risen to claim dominance over the entire universe, and maybe even beyond. Vegeta, making his home planet be Mars, senses something on Earth and goes there to see what's up. Once there, he eavesdrops on the conversation and then joins in, telling them he can take him on by himself. Seeing a destroyer, they bow down and worship him, being weirded out by it and just telling them to elaborate. They say the name is Moro and he has escaped the galactic prison and is now setting course for Namek. So Vegeta says he'll pay him a visit then, instant transmissioning to Namek. Once he arrived, the Namekians greeted him, however he went straight to the point that Moro is coming to their planet, scaring everyone out of their boots. They say that he's really strong according to their book of legends and that he has been imprisoned when a legendary god defeated him. Vegeta just says that it will be over soon as he never backs down from a challenge and since he is a god of destruction, he will end him quick when he chooses to. He also promises he will try not to hurt the planet too much and they agree to make Namek the battle playground. Just then, Moro arrives on the planet, 
Seeing Vegeta there made him regret coming there, but knows that if he uses his powers properly, he will win. Vegeta breaks the silence. Well, 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 if it isn't Moro the Magician, are you gonna pull out rabbits out of the hat or fight? You dare speaking to me like that? Guess it can't be helped, just as much as your hairline. <laughs> this hairline will tear you apart once I finish playing with you. With that, the fight begins with Vegeta using his full power from base right from the start and he seems to be holding an edge. Moro is starting to steal his energy, receiving destroyer energy along with it and begins using it to his advantage by throwing it at Vegeta. Vegeta swiftly dodges it. Just then, he notices that he's getting weaker, so he tells Moro that if he wants a fair fight, he needs to give up trying to drain his energy. Moro agrees. By taking the planet's energy for himself instead of Vegeta's, Vegeta realizes that the Namekians are getting weaker by the minute as Moro is getting stronger. Vegeta then pulls out his Super Saiyan 4 fused with Super Saiyan Blue and starts pounding Moro into oblivion. Moro is running out of energy faster than he can gather it, and Vegeta doesn't have enough pity to care anymore and continues to pound it. Moro then starts to cheat again by taking Vegeta's energy again. And of course, Vegeta notices it but doesn't say a thing as he continues the onslaught on Moro. Vegeta then stops and tells Moro to follow it. I don't know if you noticed it, but never in my life did I have to use my full power against someone. Would you like to be my first victim? What are you trying to say? <laughs> I'm way out of your league, Moro. It's a real shame. If you weren't a cheater in combat, I'd mess around with you a little bit more. All matters aside, there is a form I've been working on for quite some time. Now that i figured out a way to deal with it, might as well. I only ever used it once, in a time chamber. Want to see what a real Saiyan is capable of? Vegeta then starts transforming. His power is multiplying on itself every second, and if you could see the expression on Moro's face in the what if, it's beyond scared shitless. Vegeta then explodes in a violent flash of purple light. As the dust settles, Moro witnesses a power never seen before. Vegeta looks like his old self, just like a Super Saiyan 4, but with purple fur and black eyeliner and pupils. Vegeta has finally surpassed the Saiyan prophecy as he becomes a primal god. This transformation combines the multipliers of all his forms into one, creating a giant multiplier. Vegeta then raises his hand and says an iconic line. Hakai! Moro then starts disappearing from existence, then and there. With Moro now gone, the Namekians congratulate him on the victory, saying that he just backed up his bravado they thought was fake. Vegeta just smirks and tells them not to underestimate him. It's been about a week since the fight with Moro. Whis and Vegeta are in the outskirts of a city, training. Vegeta then senses a very high power level that's bigger than both Whis and him. Vegeta then senses a very high power level that's bigger than both him and Whis combined, coming their way. So Vegeta goes to investigate. He sees someone with his iconic hair and in a spandex. So, I take your Vegeta, of course. Who the hell are you? I'm Vegeta T23. I have a little proposition for you. How about a multiversal tournament? Many Vegetas are down, how about you? A tournament? Yeah, if you had a tournament of power, it has the same rules, but instead of fighting individuals from your multiverse, you'll be fighting other versions of you from various multiverses. Sounds fun, don't you think? Other versions of me? Kill me in. But when? I'll notify you about it when we're nearing the milestone I have to surpass. And with that, we're done with this what if. Thank you for watching. If you believe you know what I'm about to do in the near future, then click dislike. But if you like the video, hit that like button. If you'd like me to cover your idea in the near future, comment down below. And as always, peace out.